his feet again. If these two, Jessica Lynn and Sean Allen, survived the flight, why haven't they contacted the authorities? Why haven't you found them? Maldonado sat back, visibly relaxing into the task. Two very good questions, both of which stop us from being too optimistic. It is possible, though, that either or both of these individuals were concussed, able to walk away from the site but confused and weak. Head injuries can have all sorts of unpredictable effects. They may have walked only a short distance before having to stop, but far enough to have taken themselves out of our search area. It started to rain very heavily yesterday, shortly after the balloon came down. They may have headed for shelter, but been too weak to go on. I think we have to remember, the acting chief interrupted, that the Northumberland National Park covers an area of nearly 400 square miles, and that it's surrounded by a much larger area of open countryside. There are no towns, very few roads and villages. We're talking about a big and challenging area to search, even with the very sophisticated equipment that we have at our disposal. The large flat screen on the wall behind the two men came to life, showing two portrait photographs. The one on the right was that already shown of the pilot in his company uniform. The second was of a woman with curly dark hair, held back from her face with glittering pins, who looked younger than thirty-six. In the photograph, Jessica Lane was smiling confidently. She was wearing makeup, earrings, and an emerald green jacket. She could not have looked more different to the cold, wet, pitiful creature trying to sink further down beneath the cafe table, except for the bright green jacket. We're asking anyone out and about in the National Park today to keep their eyes peeled and their ears open, Maldonado went on. Similarly, if anyone noticed anything unusual yesterday afternoon, then please get in touch with us. We urgently need to speak to the pilot, and both these people may need medical attention. She had to get out. She grabbed the borrowed, stolen, blue coat from the back of her chair and pulled it on over the green jacket. Tugging the hood up around her face, she slipped out of the café. As the door slammed shut, she looked back through the glass. All six occupants of the café were staring at her. Chapter 53 They're bound to run with the pilot leaping out angle, said the head of communications as she, Ajax, and the acting chief huddled in the corridor for the usual press conference debrief. After the German wings incident and the mystery of what happened to the Malaysian plane, suicide by pilot is becoming a big story. Upsetting for his parents, but I can't see how that could rebound on us, said the boss. Uh, neither can I, at the moment, she replied. Mind you, it's only a matter of time before we have to come clean— and admit that Jessica Lane was a police officer. If we don't even know what force she was attached to by that time, we're going to look pretty daft. And then there's the mystery of the missing mobile phones. Ah, sorry, dear Jack said. Meant to tell you. I had a call from the site before we went into the conference room. Six phones found this morning, scattered around the site like I said they'd be. Several failed calls to the emergency services on each. Nothing else obvious so far. Look, you're both going to have to excuse me. I'm due to take Mother Hildegard to the mortuary, and I'm already running late. Does that need to be you? Ajax ran a hand through his hair. I said I'd pick her up. I'll be on the other end of the phone if anyone needs me. Superintendent! Ajax turned to see Stacy's head poking out of the main office. Cafe owner on the phone from a place called Belford, she called. Tiny town a few miles from the coast. He nodded. I know it. She says Jessica Lane was in a cafe eating breakfast. Saw herself on the news and rushed out. How long ago? Less than five minutes. Ajax set off for the main office, 
the others close behind. Chapter 54 The kids were playing with one of the old wooden wheels. It lay on the cinders, its one scarish paintwork now faded and peeling. They were chasing each other, jumping between spokes. Patrick had to step around them to get to his van. He'd been hoping to avoid seeing his mother, but she came into view as he approached the driver's door. She and a couple of the other women were braiding the hair of one of his younger cousins. Where are you off to? She didn't look up. A trail of red ribbon drooped from her teeth. She's been spotted. The woman who's walked. I've got to go. Spotted where? She pulled the ribbon from her mouth and started weaving it in and out of the long black hair of the girl sitting on the upturned barrel. He looked away. He could never watch this hair-braiding ritual. Belford, he said. That's miles away. The police will get there first. No, they won't. There's no patrol cars anywhere near. Do you even know who you're looking for? Mary asked. Have you got a picture? Jimmy's going to find one and send it through to me. She let the braid fall and took a step towards him. In the presence of the youngsters, she lowered her voice. Pat, you're taking too big a risk. Even if she saw you, she can't identify you. She doesn't know who you are. It's better to stay away from her now. Too many people looking. And it's broad daylight. What can you do in broad daylight? I'll see you later, Mur. He climbed into his van and started the engine. And this is the fucking problem. His mother strode up to the driver's door. She tried to pull the handle, but he'd locked it. You're not after her because you need to be, she called after him as he pulled away. You're doing it because you enjoy it. She didn't intend him to hear what she said next. At least he didn't think she meant for him to hear it. She'd lowered her voice and half turned away. He did hear it, though. He had ears like a fucking bat, and he didn't miss a thing. The boy's not right, she said to one of the other women. Never has been, never will be. Chapter 55 She could not run. She could not run. They would chase her for sure if she ran. She could feel the food she'd eaten churning in her stomach. She had to get out of sight. Give herself a moment to think. She turned down the first street she came to, walking as quickly as she dared. It was raining again, which would help. People would be keeping their heads down. Jessica Lane of York, the only survivor of the balloon crash. Everyone in the country was looking for her. He was looking for her. He would find her. The road she'd turned into was a dead end. Why hadn't she seen that? At the end of the road was the church. Confused and weak, Maldonado had said. She was weak, certainly, but was she confused? She remembered the dead voices she'd heard the day before, the shadowy hallucinations, her inability to think clearly, to properly remember what had happened. She'd been concussed, it was obvious now. She passed through the church porch and along the path, knowing she was about to heave. The breakfast she'd eaten was going to pour out of her. She stopped, leaning on a headstone for support. Can I help you in some way? The man standing in the church doorway was the priest. He wore black trousers and a padded black coat, but his clerical collar was visible beneath. His hair was short, sandy, looked as though it might curl if grown a little longer. Are you ill? he said. Can I get you a glass of water? He was a young man, not much more than thirty-five, and he had one hand on the church door. Would you like to come inside for a few minutes? It's doing the proverbial cats and dogs out here. There was something about his simple, friendly smile that drew her to him. She stepped forward. I'm Catholic. His smile widened. 
I'm not proud. Of course, a lot of people, most of your lot, in fact, would say that's exactly our problem. But it's too late for me to change now. So come inside, pet, put your feet up. She glanced around, saw no one in sight, and followed him into the church. Oh, it's brass monkeys in here. Come on through to the vestry. He led the way up the side aisle. Halfway up, she stopped walking. You don't have time for this, she said. I'm fine, really. He glanced at his watch. I have a meeting with the church wardens in thirty minutes. Until then, I'm twiddling my thumbs. You're doing me a favour. The vestry was already warm, but the priest switched on an electric fan heater before disappearing through another door. Kettle's just boiled, he called back. Coffee all right for you? The room was small. A large wooden wardrobe stood against one wall, a mirror on the wall opposite. A window looked out over the churchyard and the fields beyond. She should be crossing them, making her way back towards St Cuthbert's Way. There were photographs on the desk. One a large silver-framed portrait of a young woman with dark hair and a pale, heart-shaped face. Another showed a baby boy, just old enough to sit upright, with bright ginger hair, grinning at the camera. She caught a sour smell, a second before she spotted a pair of muddy trainers in the corner, and an open gym bag. The priest came back, carrying two mugs, a plate of biscuits balanced on one of them. Sit down, loosen your coat. Sip hot liquid. You'll be right as rain in a few minutes. Putting the tray down on the desk, he unfastened his own coat and pulled it off. He wore a waxed wool sweater beneath. Tell me if it gets too hot in here. Ginger nut? She stared back at him. He put the biscuit down and handed over a box of tissues. She cried silently for a while pressing tissues to her face to stifle any sob that threatened to slip through. When she was calmer, he swapped the tissue box for the coffee mug and watched her drink. Better? he asked. She shook her head. My sister died yesterday. It was real then. Finally, she'd said it, and made it real. He was silent for a second, then said, I'm sorry to hear that. I don't think I can go on without her in my life. She started sobbing again and made no effort to keep silent. He let her cry for a while longer. She stopped when above the noise she was making, she thought she heard something in the church. She blew her nose and took several deep breaths. She glanced round at the door. Would you say you're a woman of faith? The priest asked. She sniffed. I told you, I'm Catholic. Creases appeared at the corner of his mouth. Lots of people would describe themselves as such. It doesn't mean they believe in God. My sister did. And she was the smartest, most sensible person I've ever known. He had to realise she hadn't answered, but he didn't push it. What can I do to help? he asked. She shook her head. I don't know. Nothing. I shouldn't even be here. I should go. Can I call a relative for you? Parent? Another sibling? When families are grieving, they should be together. She couldn't suppress the shudder. Had to wait for it to pass. There's no one, she said. My parents died years ago. I have no other family. He looked towards the door. Are you in danger? What makes you say that? You're sitting bolt upright. You can't keep still. You keep glancing over your shoulder at the door or over mine out of the window. I've seen grief many times, and I've seen fear, too. You're showing classic signs of both. She took a deep breath. 
I saw a terrible crime committed yesterday. I'm the only person left who knows what really happened. Then we should call the police. He glanced round to where a phone sat on the desk behind him. When he looked back, he held a hand up, his voice raised in alarm. No, don't panic. I, I won't, I promise. Sit down. Take it easy. She stopped at the door. You don't want to call the police? He asked. She shook her head so sharply it started hurting again. It would be the very worst thing I could do, she told him. Part Two Chapter 56 Two Years, Eight Months Earlier Close to the water's edge at Tilbury Docks, Jessica drove across the wide expanse of tarmac and pulled up just short of the police van. A yawn slipped out as she opened the car door, but the dark chill of the January night shook her awake. Even at this hour the docks were busy with people and vehicles, milling around in never-ending lines and circles. Massive ships seemed unnaturally close. The water shone oily black in the darkness, and cranes soared to the sky like predatory animals. The back doors of the police van were open, and a soft pool of light was spilling out. Several uniformed and plain-clothed officers stood around. From a surrounding scatter of cars came the illuminating flicker of blue lights. Jessica held up her warrant card for the sergeant in charge. Fourteen people were in the van, some staring at her, others keeping their eyes down. Their origins were unknown. None of them so far was showing any signs of understanding the English language. They'd been found an hour ago in the hold of a cargo ship. The master of the vessel was currently claiming to have no knowledge of them being on board. Braucht jemand Erzlich Hilfe? Does anyone need medical attention? She looked from one pair of black eyes to the next. The people were filthy, looked half-starved. No young children, thank God. Es besteht keine Notwendigkeit, Angst zu haben. Wir können helfen. There is no need to be afraid. We can help. Again, no response. She switched languages. Skont ve po hojice? Cheik tosh poche boye la kaja? Nothing. Well, that's me done, she muttered, and got ready to climb down. I tried German and Polish, she told the sergeant. I asked where they'd come from, whether they needed a doctor. I told them not to be afraid. As he put up a hand to help her, she heard a low moan from behind. She turned and caught the eye of one of the youngest. A boy. Not a child exactly, but not adult either. Fifteen, maybe. He was paler than the others, a thin sheen of sweat covering his face. Jessica stepped back into the van and approached the boy. She raised a hand, and when he didn't flinch, put the back of it on his forehead. Sergeant, this one looks very sick. She turned back to the watching officer. He's running a hell of a temperature. She put out a hand, beckoning the boy forward. He didn't move so much as fall towards her. Immediately the woman on his right pulled him back. Are you his mother? Jessica asked. Sinzi di Mutter. You can come with him if you're his mother. But we need to get him to hospital. Ja, said the woman. Ich bin seine Mutter. Jessica and the boy's mother sat side by side in the reception area of Basildon Hospital's Accident and Emergency Department. In the forty minutes since the ambulance had pulled up and the sick boy had been rushed inside, she'd managed to glean a few facts about the immigrant group. She'd started by asking the boy's name and been told it because mothers are programmed to tell the names of their children. The name Mohammed told her something else. The immigrants were Muslims. The people she remembered from the van had had a Middle Eastern look about them. Dark hair, skin, eyes— 
but few people in the Middle Eastern or Arab world speak German. So she'd guessed Bosnia, and been rewarded with a startled look and then a single confirmatory nod. How long has Mohammed been sick? she'd asked. His mother held up ten fingers. Ten days. Footsteps came towards them. Jessica looked up to see a man in green scrubs approaching. Detective Constable Lane. That's me. Jessica stood up. This is Dula, Mohammed's mother. Come this way, please. They followed him along the corridor and into a small treatment room. Mohammed lay on his side on the narrow metal bed, his eyes closed. Can you tell her that her son is comfortable and that we're waiting for a bed to become free? She can stay with him tonight if she wishes. Jessica translated the first part. She was far from sure Dula would be allowed to stay in the hospital. The other immigrants had been taken to Basildon Police Station and from there would probably be transferred to a detention centre in Middlesex. What's the matter with him? Jessica asked the doctor. He seemed to be running a temperature. Serious infection. The doctor's face was grave. We've given him antibiotics. Hopefully we'll have caught it in time. He's also on a lot of painkillers, so he's going to be very groggy for the next few hours. We can get him cleaned up when we get him up to the ward. But he's going to be okay? Jessica caught Dula staring at her. In response, the doctor stepped towards the bed and gently raised the cover from Mohammed. In the small of the boy's back, to the right of his spine, was a large, fresh surgical dressing. The skin around it was red and inflamed. What happened to him? Jessica asked. We haven't had a chance to X-ray and scan him yet, but I'd put money on him having recently had a kidney removed. Dula was holding her son's hands tight. Her head had fallen forward. Dula? said Jessica. In response, Mohammed's mother stood up. She shrugged off her jacket and then the large sweater she was wearing under it. She raised her shirt to let them see the dirty surgical dressing on her own back. These people have been selling their kidneys, said the doctor. You'll probably find similar scars on the whole lot. Late in the winter afternoon, the laurels were gleaming with a silver frosting, and unswept leaves carpeted the path. The sunlight had become a dull yellow pool in the sky. The trees that grew around the perimeter wall of Winding Priory stood in stark outline against the grey sky, and were skeletal black where the late sunlight couldn't reach them. The two sisters passed through the creaking, paint-peeling iron gate and left the convent grounds. They sold their kidneys to fund their trip to the UK. Isabel's usually pale face was white with shock. It really doesn't bear thinking about, Jessica agreed. That boy was only fourteen. The wind around them was rough and noisy even for early February, tossing gulls high into the sky and hurling sand into their faces. As the sisters moved out of the shelter of the wall, Isabel's robes began to flap around her body. She caught hold of the edges of her black serge cloak and pulled them close. They reached the dunes and began to climb, sinking deeper into the sand with every step. Great strides made little progress, and both women were breathing faster by the time they reached the top. The wind hit them with renewed strength. Is he okay? Isabel asked. Uh, he's fine. His parents and his two older brothers are all okay too, despite having only one kidney each. And the good news is they'll probably be given permission to stay here. Oh, they paid a very high price for the privilege. Before them the cloud was low and threatening, the sea turbulent, a mass of churning grey and white. It was hard to pinpoint exactly where one ended and the other began. Even Holy Island out across the water and its hilltop castle were blurred, sometimes visible, sometimes not. 
Often when the sisters walked along the beach, they could see sailing yachts, fishing boats, passenger ferries. Today, a single grey container ship moved across the water. Isabel began to step down, finding clumps of tussock grass to steady her feet. She had to shout, to keep turning her head back, so that Jessica could hear her. So what can you do? Very little, Jessica yelled back. We can patrol the docks, but when your country is an island, there are a lot of small harbours to keep an eye on. We can try to find out who these gangs are, who their contacts are in this country, but the people we rescue, the smugglers we catch, often know very little about the chain of command. Take this one group, for example. The people moving them changed several times on the journey. Bosnians drove them through Croatia, and then the gang who took them across Italy spoke French with North African accents. Then others got involved in Spain, and a Spanish crew brought them to Tilbury. Isabel stopped halfway down to shake something from her boot. It sounds like a long and very ugly chain. Ah, tell me about it. <sighs> we have the crew of the ship detained, and we'll be sharing what they tell us with Interpol, but it's a big problem. So many desperate people in the world wanting to come to the rich countries, prepared to do anything they can to get here and lots of unscrupulous types willing to take whatever they can get their hands on. Once on the beach, the two women crossed from soft, springy sand to a swathe that was firm, packed and damp. As they turned to walk along the wave's edge, Isabel had to hold her veil back from her face. And people can survive with only one kidney, she asked. Yes, donation within families isn't uncommon, even here. If you were ill, I'd probably find one I could spare. Isabel's face tightened. That's good of you, but I can't help thinking organs are a little wasted on me. Jessica stopped walking. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing, said Isabel. I just spoke without thinking. Come on, keep up. They walked for a minute in silence. I don't know how you resist swimming here, Jessica said. In the summer, I mean, not now. But there are few temptations at Winding Priory, replied Isabel. I rarely bother resisting those that present themselves. Jessica looked at her sister, at her beautiful, impassive face surrounded by the white veil, and then back at the churning, frothing sea. Really? she said. The water can look very inviting on moonlit nights, Isabel said. And we're still only allowed one bath a week. Woof! A sudden gust had hit the two women hard, ripping Isabel's veil from her head, taking the cap she wore beneath with it. It had been years since Jessica had seen her sister's hair. There were strands of grey in it, but it wasn't as short as she remembered. The tight curls were still the same. In the wind they danced around her head, getting into her eyes. Jessica set off after the veil, but Isabel was faster. She overtook her sister, and in spite of the constricting gown and cloak, she soon pulled ahead. The veil landed on a patch of damp sand, close to the surf. Isabel grabbed it and then came jogging back up the beach. Does the Vatican enter an Olympic team? Jessica said. Isabel was barely breathing heavily. She tucked the veil into her sleeve. I could always whip your ass in a sprint, she said. So it's out of your hands. You can go back to tracing stolen cars. Yep, they found another better interpreter. They don't need me any more. One thing did puzzle me, though. Something Doula said when I went back to see them a week later in the detention centre. What's that? She said, No one wants to go to the northern ports. Nobody wants to go to the northern ports. Isabel's face had screwed up, partly because of the wind, partly as a result of what she'd just heard. There was a place in northern Spain where they were held for several days. 
said Jessica. There were a lot of people waiting there, apparently, lots of different routes into the UK. It was a sort of... Do you know what I mean by hub? I'm a nun, not an idiot. Oh, sorry, well... Well, while they were waiting for transport to become available, they got talking to others. One of the young women Mohammed got to know was very pretty. I dread to think what she had to offer these people to get passage. Oh, but anyway, one of the smugglers had told her that whatever happened, she had to avoid going to the northern ports. London, Kent, Essex, even East Anglia, but not the north. The North is a bad place. What does that mean? Isabel asked. We don't know. They didn't know. Just that nobody wants to end up in the North of England. We should get back, Isabel said. Mother Hildegard will have little patience even with you if you keep the others waiting for their tea. The women began to walk back along the beach. I was going to join you for Compline, Jessica said. Will that be all right? Of course. But I won't be able to say goodbye to you afterwards. I know. After the last service of the day, the nuns would retire for the night, flowing back to their private rooms, surrounded by silence until the next hour of recreation. At the bottom of the dunes was a short, sandy track that took them back to the convent gate. Hang on a minute. Jessica's hand froze on the heavy iron frame. This gate is padlocked at dusk. How'd you get out for your moonlight skinny dipping? Isabel passed inside and closed the gate carefully. I said nothing about skinny dipping, or dipping in any sort of apparel. You're letting your imagination run away with you. She stopped, facing the wall. But if... For the sake of argument, someone needed to get out of the convent grounds at night. The mortar in the wall here is quite worn, and there are several places, see, there, and there, where a foot can get a hold. Jessica looked at the wall. It was probably as old as the convent itself, built of great stone pieces. There wasn't the money any more to keep it in perfect repair. She had a sudden flashback to the two of them as children, scaling a wall to get into a neighbour's garden, Isabel going first, as always, moving with a strength and speed that the younger Jessica never dreamed she'd have. And always, once she'd made it to the top, seeing her big sister on the ground at the other side, arms held wide, ready to catch her. And how'd she get out of the house? I can't believe the doors aren't locked. Isabel's feet began to crunch along the path towards the convent building. Look directly ahead. See the flat roof at the back of the kitchen? The place we call the lower outer. Jessica followed her. Hmm? Now see the narrow ledge running around the building at its first floor level? Well, it's not as narrow as it looks from here. And it's quite solid. It leads round to a bathroom window with a very dodgy lock. I'm still speaking hypothetically, you understand. Jessica stepped ahead and turned, blocking the path. Bella, why do you not just leave? This place served its purpose years ago. Come with me now. Bella's brown eyes stared back at her as though she didn't quite understand what her sister was saying. You can live with me. I can help you get settled. It's not too late. It can't be. Isabel's eyes dropped, and when she spoke, her voice was as hard as ice. Don't be silly. I'm very happy here. Your life has no purpose. Isabel looked up, condemnation in her eyes that you, of all people, should say that. You have always had faith. Jessica knew she wasn't going to win this. Not now. Maybe not ever. 
She stepped out of her sister's way, and the two women set off towards the shadow of the convent. As they walked, Jessica had a sense of the silence creeping over her sister once again. She always fought it if she could. Anything you want me to bring you when I come next? Isabel gave a grateful smile. The train is getting a bit worse for wear, but save it for my birthday. That's six months away. Mother Hildegard doesn't approve of gifts. One a year you might get away with. They walked on towards the rear door of the priory. What are you going to do? Isabel wasn't talking about birthday gifts. Nothing, Jessica said. I'm based in London. When we come across more illegal immigrants, we can ask them about this business of the North being a bad place. I've already sent a bulletin to Northern Constabularies. But, you know, North could be anywhere from Whitby to Aberdeen. So unless something else comes up, there really is nothing to be done. The chapel bell began ringing. Recreation time was over. Isabel replaced her veil, tucking her dark curls out of sight. As they drew closer to the building, her head drooped, her hand slipped behind her large sleeves. Out of reach of the wind, her robe settled themselves around her. Her footsteps slowed, and Jessica felt the familiar sense of loss. Her sister was turning back into a nun. Chapter 57 It was two months before something else came up. The Diana Memorial Playground in London's Kensington Gardens was swarming with preschool children and their mothers and nannies. Jessica had to step around a prone, weeping mermaid and a spider-man peeing in the shrubbery as she made her way towards the giant replica pirate ship. She left the path twice to avoid racing toddlers. As she drew closer to the centre, the cold crept into her pockets and nipped at her fingers. She should have worn gloves, a hat. Around her, the playground had been planted with evergreen shrubs, but elsewhere in the park, most of the trees still had their spindly winter look. On her way here, she'd passed daffodils on the path edge, but their flowers had yet to bloom, were still tight and green, not wanting to face the late spring chill. On the edge of the sandy beach that surrounded the ship, she spotted a woman in a red coat. In her mid-thirties, of Indian origin, her face had a pinched, nervy look. Her eyes were fixed on the deck of the pirate ship. As Jessica watched, she waved at it, before raising her phone and taking a picture. Jessica walked over and sat down beside her on a bench that felt cold even through her clothes. Neither woman spoke. Jessica pulled her oversized bag onto her lap and took out a blue teddy. She put the bag back on the ground and pulled an unopened pack of nappies over the rolled-up newspaper that was padding out the rest of it. I was a bit worried you wouldn't be allowed in. Jasmine Sharma glanced over with large amber eyes. I forgot about the rule, the one about no unaccompanied adults. I blagged it, Jessica said. I looked stressed, pretended to be on my phone and looking for someone. No one can see us talking in here. Jasmine's eyes flicked up to the deck of the pirate ship. The planting was deliberate, to prevent the wrong sort of people watching the children. Up on the mast of the ship, a skinny, brown-skinned boy waved. Jasmine waved back. Jessica did, too. Then she made the blue bear wave. When we spoke on the phone, you said you were concerned about a doctor on Harley Street that your father had consulted, Jessica said, that you thought he might be behaving unethically, even illegally. Jasmine said nothing. Jessica tucked the bear back in the bag. It had served its purpose. I'm listening, she urged. A little over a year ago, my father was diagnosed with advanced heart disease, Jasmine said. 
He was fitted with a pacemaker, put on a special diet, prescribed drugs, but his condition worsened. Doctors started to talk about months, not years, and that the only possible long-term treatment was a heart transplant. I'm sorry to hear that. Unfortunately, or so he was told, there are very few hearts available in any given year. Most people in this country die before a transplant becomes a real possibility, and hardly any hearts are suitable for people from Asia and the Indian subcontinent. A scream nearby caught Jessica's attention. She turned, instantly on alert. It was only a child. He was still quite a young man, Jasmine said. Sixty-four. He didn't want to die. He began asking around his friends and business colleagues. After a few months, someone recommended a transplant surgeon on Harley Street, a Mr. Ralph Wallace. Dad made an appointment. Jessica committed the name to memory. Did you go with him? No, but he talked about it afterwards. He said that Mr. Wallace had been very encouraging. In what way? He told my father that in other countries the laws aren't so strict and people are less squeamish. He said that overseas people are more willing to donate organs because there's financial compensation that is illegal here, said Jasmine. Say, for example, a young man was killed in a road accident. The hospital would pay his family well for his organs, knowing they could sell them on to several people who are waiting. The family are pragmatic. They've lost a loved one, but the money can help those who are still living. Well, I have to see the logic, said Jessica. But this would have meant your father travelling to somewhere like India for his heart operation. No, not so. He would stay here. The heart would be brought to him. Jessica had a picture of air ambulances, of medics running across rooftops, clutching precious white boxes. Except, how could that be? Don't organs have to be transplanted within a few hours? Surely you can't fly a heart over from India and it'd still be viable? No, you can't, I checked. A heart can survive for ten hours maximum after harvesting. There's no way it can be flown over from India. So how? The donor is flown over. The dead donor? Jasmine gave a tiny shudder. No, not dead. Not properly, anyway. He would be brain dead, or donation would be out of the question, obviously. But the machines keeping him alive would be kept switched on. He'd be flown with a medical team in a specially adapted aeroplane to the UK, so that the harvest could take place in the same hospital as the transplant. OK, that does sound a bit grim, said Jessica. Grim? It, it can't be legal, surely. Did your father ask any difficult questions? Of course. My father wasn't a villain. Mr. Wallace told him that because the financial transaction took place in India, the matter was perfectly legal, and because the transplant was carried out privately in this country, it was a matter between surgeon and patient. But you weren't happy with that? No, and neither was my father. He wanted to live, but not at any price. Why didn't he go to the police? He was thinking about it. Mm, being strictly honest, I think he was keeping his options open. And then his condition worsened. He died two weeks ago. I'm sorry. Silence. Jessica looked around again, at the trees and bushes, at the railings, at the blue bear in her bag. So why are you frightened? she asked. No reply. Why did you want to meet me here, where no one will think we're anything other than two mothers? For the first time, Jasmine took her eyes off her son and dropped them to the sand. I went to see Mr. Wallace a few days ago. I was troubled by what my father had told me. I didn't feel I could just let it rest. 
Ah. He told me it was nonsense. He claimed it had been my father who'd asked about the availability of organs overseas, and that he, uh, Mr. Wallace I'm talking about now, had advised against it, because the surgery would be unsafe. He said my father must have been confused, that people often become desperate in the final days of their life. Well, that may actually be true. Jasmine opened the clasp of her bag and reached inside. Yesterday morning, I got this in the post. She handed over a stiff brown envelope. Jessica upturned it and looked at the photograph that had fallen out. A boy of about five years old, wearing school uniform in a playground, taken through the bars of a railing. That's Raffi, said Jasmine, my older son, taken at his school and sent anonymously. Coming so soon after my meeting with Mr. Wallace, I couldn't help making a connection, seeing it as a threat. Am I being stupid? Jessica slid the photograph back into the envelope. She could have it checked for prints, although she had a feeling she wouldn't find anything. Not necessarily, she said. Chapter 58 And what is the name of this surgeon? The director of the National Transplant Database held her pen poised above her notebook. Jessica let her eyes fall. I'd prefer not to say for now. My informant was very nervous about speaking to me at all, and I promised her complete confidentiality. The director closed her notebook and made a point of finishing her coffee. She wasn't actually present in any of these meetings, if I understand you correctly. She may have misunderstood what her father was telling her. That's entirely possible. But before I close the case, can you tell me whether what she was saying is at all credible? The director shook her head and put her cup onto its saucer with an air of business concluded. Oh, the problem, as she's described it, is accurate enough. There is a crisis of solid organs in the UK, particularly among people from the Middle East, India and the Asian subcontinent. Because donation is frowned upon in these cultures. The director glanced through the glass partitioning of her office and held up a finger to someone inside. Partly, she said, although donation is a difficult issue in every culture, Mainly, the shortage occurs simply because there is a broader population of Caucasian people here in the UK. Another reason is that people from these ethnic groups are more prone to certain diseases that impact upon the major organs. And ethnic background is a factor, Jessica said. Uh, you can't put, sorry to be crude, a, a black heart in a white body. It's a little more complicated than that. You said you'd looked at our website. Jessica nodded. She'd been up early to avoid rush hour traffic on the M4 and had arrived at the Bristol headquarters an hour ahead of schedule. She'd had plenty of time to mug up. So you'll know that in the UK there is one central database of everyone who needs a transplant and everyone who has chosen to be an organ donor. We manage that database here. And you coordinate matches, a sort of organ-centred dating agency. The director showed no sign of finding that amusing. When organs become available, following a fatal accident, or sometimes a natural illness that doesn't compromise the organs, when that happens, as long as the next of kin doesn't withhold consent, the hospital where the potential donor is situated will alert us and we will identify the best matches. Such huge power over people's lives. How is that done? Just whoever's been waiting the longest? Length of time waiting is a factor. Most importantly of all, the blood group and HLA, the human leukocyte antigen, have to be compatible. 
Then we have a matrix system that takes into account factors such as the recipient's age, their circumstances, their chances of reasonable quality of life, their location. Location? Yes, indeed. If we have a heart in Glasgow and two potential recipients, one in Edinburgh, one in Truro, then all other things being equal, we'll favour the one in Edinburgh. Hmm, thank you. That's useful to know. So you see, no transplants take place in the UK that we don't know about, that we don't manage, that we don't authorise. No hospital, no medical team would work on a transplant that hadn't been coordinated through us. The system is foolproof. As the director spoke, Jessica's eyes flowed round to the framed images on the wall behind her desk. In one of the photographs she was posing with the Prime Minister. And as for the idea of smuggling still-living but brain-dead donors in via a major UK airport, well, it's simply absurd. The lowering sun was painting the clouds and the sea a soft shell pink, and the dunes gleamed with warm colour. Jessica raised one bare foot and watched a sparkling trail fall from it back into the water. Absurd, huh? And yet you have an intelligent, educated woman who believed that her intelligent, educated father was told exactly that, said Isabel. Jessica sighed. The busy director told me that if I was prepared to give her the names involved, the surgeon and the patient, she could look into it. Otherwise, she could only conclude this was about nothing more than an elderly and frightened man getting confused. Isabel said, So that's it? End of investigation? From further down the beach came the sound of excited squealing. One of the noisier nuns had dropped the hem of her robe and was flapping her arms on the point of falling over. Another strode over quickly, grabbing the arm of her panicking sister and pulling her back towards the shore. At the water's edge, seven more black-clad figures waded, splashed or stood in the surf, gazing out to sea. Behind them, the low hills of Holy Island glowed golden in the early evening light. I think Sister Belinda waded out further than she intended, Isabel said. There's a shelf there. It gets deep quite quickly. Whoops, there she goes. Jessica smiled as Sister Belinda, losing her balance again, sank to her chest in the water and howled her shock to the sky. There never was an investigation, she said, answering Isabel's question. There was a complaint of sorts, but the woman concerned was too scared to make it official, and the authorities have told me that what she alleges is impossible. Isabel said nothing. <laughs> this really is quite surreal. Jessica let her eyes travel the length of the beach. Twenty of the sisters, nearly half the convent's population, had come out for the evening's recreation hour. All but two had removed shoes and stockings to wade in the water. How did you persuade Mother Hildegard to agree? Every sister in the convent apart from me is plagued with foot infections. Verrucas, athlete's foot, yellowing, crumbly toenails. They take off their shoes during recreation hour and compare ailments. Jessica pulled a face. You realise I may never eat again. I managed to convince Mother that regular exposure to seawater would cure 90% of the problems. She's limited us to paddling, for now. Isabel grinned. I'm slowly introducing the benefits of full salt water immersion. That lot are riddled with yeast infections. Oh, no, please, no more. Is there really nothing else you can do? What about the convent's health problems? About this doctor on Harley Street? Can you not send someone in, you know, undercover? We call it covert surveillance these days. Have someone join the cleaning or administrative team as the usual route. But it could take months to uncover something, if there's anything there. 
But you'll keep an eye on it, Isabel said. You won't let it drop. Jessica smiled. I have two consciences, my own and that of my sister, the Carmelite nun. Mm, you should be grateful, really. You have your own brain and free use of mine whenever you need it. Goodness knows it has little enough to do most of the time. Bella, do you never feel the urge to get out more? I know you've told me dozens of times you don't want to leave, but lots of nuns work in the community. They teach, they nurse. Isabel's face had fallen again. I'm neither teacher nor nurse. You can run an office, work a computer. I operate a computer that would be classed as antique by anyone in the outside world and run an office that belongs to the pages of a Dickens novel. All I can do is pray and think. Jessica stopped walking. And hide? Isabel glanced back up the beach, to where most of the nuns had left the water. We should get back, she said. I'm on peacock duty. They left the water and walked back to where they'd left their shoes in the shelter of the dunes. I've been thinking... Isabel said as she sat on the sand to dust off her feet. Are there statistics you can check? I mean, the actual numbers of transplants taking place according to different ethnic groups. If the number of black and Asian transplants has increased substantially, or if there's a particular cluster in a given area, that might point to something going on. Their shoes back on. Both women stood up. Jessica gestured for her sister to go first up the dune. The other nuns had left the beach now, and their chatter trailed behind them like litter. Do you think about this stuff a lot? she said. Oh, of course not. A nun's thoughts are trained at all times upon her relationship with God. Oh, just when I'm here, then? Yes, just when you're here. So could you? Oh, I tried and I did see some fluctuation year on year. The trouble is that overall numbers involved are too small to draw any meaningful conclusions, and illegal operations, if they're happening, wouldn't be on official figures anyway, would they? I guess not. One thing I did learn was that this Mr. Wallace has consulting rooms in the North East, as well as Harley Street. Isabel looked back. Near here? Well, not far. Newcastle. He divides his time between here and London. And is that... sinister? Ah, oh, not really. I did compare transplant figures in London and in the North East to the UK average, and actually they were up a bit, but given the ethnic population in cities like Newcastle and London, you'd probably expect that. It certainly wasn't enough to set alarm bells ringing. Except with you. Yes, except with me. I can't really explain it, Bella. I know Jasmine was telling me the truth. They reached the top of the dune. The other sisters were already back in the convent grounds. Yes, but maybe Wallace wasn't, Isabel said. What do you mean? Maybe he makes big promises takes the money and then lets the patients die while they're waiting for the life-saving organ to miraculously appear. Jessica pretended to frown. Should nuns bandy that word about? Or organ? Miraculously. If she, or rather her father, was telling the truth and remembering accurately, there must be other patients he said the same thing to. Can you get hold of a list of his patients? Not without a court order, and I don't have nearly enough to even broach the subject with the boss. Jessica sighed. Ah, it's going nowhere, Bella. I should give it up. I will. I will give it up. Isabel laughed out loud. <laughs> no, you won't. 
Chapter 59 Thursday, the 21st of September She was still on her feet, halfway to the door. I can't contact the police, she told the priest. Not here, not in Northumberland. Frown lines contracted his brow. I don't understand. I can't trust them. The police? He looked mystified. I can't tell you why, but I have good reason not to. He took a deep breath and blew it out again through pursed lips. Is it about why the balloon crashed? The start of her head told him everything he needed to know. I was watching the news on my iPad before you arrived. I'm very glad to see that you're all right, Jessica. She sat back down again. Have you considered that you're probably in shock? There's a nasty bruise on your temple. You could be concussed. You might even be suffering some sort of post-traumatic stress or something. You may be exaggerating the danger you're in. Maybe misinterpreting events. There's more, she said. I made a terrible mistake. I did something and I didn't realise the consequences until now. I have to put things right. I understand, he said, although his face said clearly that he didn't. They both jumped at the sound of the church door opening again. It'll be my church wardens. He stood up. He poked his head through the vestry door. Morning, Stan. Good morning, Olive. Can you give me a second? He leaned back in. I've got to see these two, but if you wait in the church, I can drive you somewhere immediately afterwards. I have to be back in Bamborough by four to pick up my son, but until then I'm at your disposal. She got to her feet. I can't ask it. It's really no problem. Where do you want to get to? She thought about it for a second. Only a second. York, she said. There are things I need to find, and someone I have to see. I have to go to York. Do you have money? Of course. There's a railway station here in Belford, but to be honest, I don't recommend you use it. If the police are looking for you, they'll have people there. I can drive you up the road to Berwick-upon-Tweed. You'll be on the direct line to York, and trains will be more frequent from there. Thank you. Also, and I'm not sure when I became an expert in avoiding the police, but if you use a mobile phone or a credit card, or get money out of the bank, they can trace you very quickly. You might like to bear that in mind. She smiled. You're very kind. He pulled open the vestry door. There's a room at the back of the nave, to one side of the main door where the mothers and toddlers group meet, They've got easy chairs and a heater you can put on. Wait for me in there. You didn't tell me your name. Harry, he said, and smiled again. Harry Laycock, vicar of the parish of St Mary Belford, at your service. Keeping her head down, avoiding eye contact with the two church wardens, she made her way down the aisle and found the mother and baby room. It had three narrow windows one of which looked out towards the church porch. A stocky, dark-haired man wearing a leather trilby was walking up the church path. Patrick Farr had found her. Chapter 60 Resisting the temptation to kick open the church door, an act he knew would piss his mother off big time, Patrick turned the handle and pushed. It had been well oiled. It didn't make a sound as he stepped inside. Out of habit, he took hold of the cross on his rosary and made the sign. Before him, separating the chancel from the nave, was a high stone arch. To his left, a white painted wall held a viewing gallery. There was a tower, too. Lots of hiding places. She was in here. There was a smell in the air that he knew instinctively belonged to her. It was the smell of fresh, cheap soap with a suggestion of fried food. According to the bozos in the café, 
who'd actually believed he was a detective. She'd spent a long time in the toilets getting cleaned up before eating breakfast. Voices. She wasn't alone. Mm, that made a difference. At the back of the church, either side of where he was standing, were two doors. He could see from the shape of the walls that there were internal rooms beyond. The voices, though, faint and anonymous, hard to tell whether male or female, were coming from the front, from behind the organ, maybe, or that room where the priest kept his robes. He went left and glanced round a small kitchen and lavatory. There was an external door in here, but it was bolted on the inside. The room to the other side of the entrance was a playroom, with bright, childish posters on the walls, and a box of toys in the corner. The cheap floral smell was stronger in here. The room had a window that overlooked the church porch. Uneasy now, he left the playroom and made his way up the centre aisle. He checked in all the pews and came to a halt in front of the vestry door. So, if you can do worship together next week here, Stan, said a man's voice, and Olive the week after, I think we're covered until George gets back. He heard low murmurs of assent, then something about the following week's flower rota. Okay, if that's it. I'm sorry to rush you guys out, but I've got someone waiting to see me. The sound of people getting to their feet, pushing back chairs. Sorry, Vicar, you should have said. No, no, this was completely unexpected. Someone who turned up out of the blue. A bit troubled, though, so I don't want to keep her waiting long. The vestry door opened, and Patrick stepped back, out of sight behind the organ. He watched a man and a woman, not the one he was looking for, walk to the rear of the church, pull open the door and leave. The priest was moving around noisily in the vestry. Without making a sound, Patrick stepped down the chancel steps, and then down the nave until he reached the front door. He pulled the bolt at the top, then the one at the bottom. Wherever she was hiding, she wasn't going to make a quick getaway. He pulled aside his jacket, found the knife he always kept there, and walked back towards the vestry. He'd never killed a priest before. Chapter 61 Say when you're ready, Mother Hildegard. Ajax stood to one side of the elderly nun. He always made sure he could see a person's face when they identified the dead. The first glimpse, either the confirmation of their worst fears, or a shocked reluctance to hope, invariably told him all he needed to know. She was inches away from the curtained window of the mortuary viewing room, closer than most people stood. Her eyes were closed, her lips twitching. She was breathing heavily, her hands clenched into fists. He waited. She crossed herself, and her eyes opened. I'm ready, she said. The heavy purple velvet curtains opened. The slender form of a young woman lay shrouded a couple of feet from the glass. The mortuary assistant folded back the sheet to reveal the head. Ajax kept his eyes on Hildegard, waiting for the reaction. It didn't come. He'd never seen this before. The complete absence of any sort of response. The nun stared, blinked, stared some more. Finally, she took a step that brought her almost into contact with the glass. She raised her hands, put her fingertips on the glass and leaned in. She might have been looking at a snake in the zoo, fascinated but repelled at the same time. Finally, Ajax let himself look at the corpse. Her dark hair had been washed clean of the blood that had stained it the day before. It curled around the sheet beneath her, spreading out from her head like a dark cloud. The skin of her face, neck and shoulders was like the inside of a shell, except where it had been scorched. 
he turned back to Hildegard. You can go inside if you prefer, he said, offering an option not usually available to the more emotional visitors. There seemed little danger of Hildegard losing control. Uh, no, thank you. I can see perfectly well. That's a terrible injury to her face. Mother Hildegard, can you confirm that this is the woman you knew as Sister Maria Magdalena? Finally, the nun showed some emotion, but Ajax could only describe it as weariness. She allowed her eyes to close, her face to relax. Yes, of course, she said. This is our beloved sister. We shall pray for her soul. Thank you, said Ajax. I'll take you home now. Her eyes snapped open. What about Jessica? Is she here too? This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program. The A1 was like a giant angry monster, roaring just out of sight. She'd found it easily enough, had heard it from the back of the church. She'd crossed the fields and was beneath it now, following its course north. But the field she was trying to cross had been ploughed and was thick with mud. Within minutes her shoes had more than doubled their weight as earth clung to them. She was forced to stop frequently, and yet hardly had she cleaned them before they clogged up again. She pressed on, knowing it could be nearly fifteen miles to Berwick-upon-Tweed. The road was too close. Each time a large lorry went by, she was showered with fine drops of oily water, mud, and even small stones. The hedge was protecting her to some extent, holding back the splashes from the cars, but the lorries were too big. It took forever to cross the first field. She fell to her knees more than once, soon filthy. It was starting to feel hopeless. Jessica! Her heart thudding, she turned. On the bank above her, having climbed over the metal barrier and pushed through the spindly plantation of young trees, stood the vicar from St. Mary's. What did this mean? Had he called the police? Was far with him. Harry began to scramble down the bank. My car's up top, he called when he was close enough. I pulled over as soon as I could. How did you find me? I saw you run past the vestry window heading for open countryside. He looked down at his own shoes and pulled a face. When my church wardens left, I saw a bloke in the church, and I really didn't like the cut of his jib. He bolted the front door, for one thing. I decided discretion was the better part of valour, and left through the vestry. Come on, I'll drive you to Berwick. Chapter 63 Do you mind my asking a question? Ajax said as he pulled out of the car park. Not at all, Hildegard told him. Whether I choose to answer it is another matter. Why was Jessica so obviously your favourite of the two sisters? All souls are precious to our father, Superintendent Maldonado. Favourites would be inappropriate. He tried again. Would it be fair to say you had more of a bond with Jessica? For a few seconds he thought he wasn't going to get an answer. Then she sighed. I suppose I always felt, if if this doesn't sound too foolish, that we got the wrong sister. Jessica was the one with the simple, unquestioning faith. I saw her joy in chapel, her pleasure in the simple rituals. She understood the nun's calling, without really having to think about it. And yet she had such a love of life. She raised people's spirits. She was a joy. And Maria Magdalena wasn't. No one ever really knew what was going on in Sister Maria Magdalena's head. She was a strong woman. 
The early years in the convent would have broken her if she hadn't been. Sounds brutal. She glanced at him sharply. The life of an enclosed order isn't all swanning about in black robes, praying by candlelight, superintendent. It's a life of endless, rigorous discipline. Few were cut out for it. I would never have believed that Sister Maria Magdalena was. And yet... Her shoulders shrugged beneath the black coat. And yet she stayed. The phone rang. It was Stacy. He pulled over, asked Hildegard to excuse him, and got out of the car. As he listened to what the constable had to say, he watched the elderly nun sitting motionless in the passenger seat. Thanks, Stace, he said, and climbed back into the car. I may have some good news for you, Mother Hildegard. She turned to him then. How so? We've already had a positive sighting of Jessica in Belford this morning. I didn't say anything because we didn't manage to pick her up and I didn't want to give you false hope. Now, though, it seems there was another one in Wooler yesterday, and a group of walkers from Buckinghamshire are pretty certain they spent some time with her on the St Cuthbert's Way. The nun's face transformed. Jessica is alive. Definitely alive. It would appear so. Not only alive, but it looks like she's heading for the Priory. Let's go and see if she's turned up, shall we? Chapter 64 The train made its way south towards York. People got into the carriage and left it. She kept her head turned to the window, taking no notice of people who sat down on the seat beside her. When the train stopped at Durham, her carriage pulled up alongside a café. Through its large picture window she could see a television screen. The recording of that morning's press conference was being shown again. Could there be a single person in the country not looking for her? Chapter 65 OK, this is the situation, said Ajax. On the basis... He stopped as the door to the conference room opened and the acting chief constable slipped inside. On the basis of no body being found at the crash site, nor any personal possessions, including no mobile phone, and with three different but equally reliable sightings, Jessica Lane has now been designated a vulnerable missing person. He paused and let his eyes travel to the other photograph pinned on the notice board. Sean Allen is similarly still missing. On the other hand, his kit bag was found inside the balloon, and we've had no sightings whatsoever of him. Here, Jax, I'm sorry to ask you to go over all ground, but can you quickly update me on the sighting of Jessica Lane this morning? The chief's eyes were fixed on the tabletop. Ajax looked over at Stacy and gave her a nod. It was in the Birdcage Cafe in Belford, said Stacy. She came in looking like keep death off the roads. The cafe owner's words, not mine. Spent a long time in the toilets, apparently getting cleaned up, and then ordered and ate a massive breakfast. When the press conference was screened on the cafe TV, she got up and left. Someone followed her out but lost her. They called us immediately. As luck would have it, though, the nearest car was forty minutes away. By the time we got there, she'd vanished. The acting chief frowned. So she knows we're looking for her. She knows people will be worried, and she's deliberately avoiding being picked up. Difficult to assume anything else, said Ajax. At this point, we thought she might be heading for the convent. St Cuthbert's Way doesn't go through Belford as such, but another well-known track, the Northumberland Coast Path, does and then meet St Cuthbert's Way a couple of miles north. From there, both paths head northeast towards Fenwick and Holy Island. I went to Winding Priory myself, but no sign of her. A couple of our guys are walking that part of the trail now in both directions. We've also put a car at the convent. Why would she go to the convent? the chief asked. Good question, said Stacy. I've had a quick chat with Paul Standish, 
His best theory is that she's in shock, possibly with a head injury, and instinctively heading for a place where she feels safe. She's been visiting the convent for twenty years. Her only family member lived there, and she was very close to Mother Hildegard. Pure conjecture, of course, said Ajax, but we know her car is still in the balloon company's car park, and that no one appears to have returned to the house in York. So she's confused, out of her mind with grief, wandering about more or less aimlessly, but in the general direction of the convent, the boss said. That's the theory we were working on, said Ajax, until young chappers heard back from the National Police Federation. We're all here, Steve, said the chief. So, I contacted the NPF yesterday evening, after the super asked me to try and trace Jessica Lane, said Chapman. As it wasn't urgent, they said it would have to wait till the morning. I had to chase three times, but they finally gave me an answer of sorts half an hour ago. Oh, you'll like this, said Ajax. Jessica Lane has been attached to the National Crime Agency for over a year now, said Chapman. When I asked for more details, what station, any of the special units, what rank, uniform or CID, I was told worked out of Scotland Yard, although the nature of her work involved being posted all over the UK, and that she had the rank of sergeant. No further information would be immediately forthcoming. The chief did a pantomime double take. Come again? They thanked me for letting them know and asked me to keep them informed of progress. She hasn't been in touch with them. Well, not that they were admitting to. She still has her phone? Her phone hasn't been found. We have to assume she still has it. Based at Scotland Yard, the NCA playing secret squirrels with us. I'm betting she was some sort of covert operative, said Ajax. Question is, did whatever she was working on have anything to do with the balloon accident? I'm not happy about this, said the chief. A covert police operation taking place under our noses that we know nothing about, and one of the officers concerned is involved in a freak fatal accident that is some way from being explained. I don't suppose we've heard anything from the lab yet. No one answered. It hadn't really been a question. Ajax sighed. I've been holding this back because I didn't want to get any hairs running, but one of the CSIs who attended the crash thought she might have spotted brain tissue on the basket. She wasn't certain. He waited. Brain tissue that probably didn't come from any of the dead passengers, he added. All the bodies we found had skulls that were still reasonably intact. So, given that Jessica is alive and walking, it must have been Sean Allen, the pilot, said Stacy. If it was brain tissue, said Ajax. Injured or killed before the crash, said Chappers or his body would still be in the basket. If it was brain tissue, repeated Ajax. What could possibly happen in a hot air balloon to break open a skull to that extent? asked Stacy. A bang on the head wouldn't do it. Gunshot, said Chapman. I knew this would happen. Ajax shook his head. We really need to wait for the lab. One more thing, Chapman spoke up. As we know, Jessica Lane's fiancé, Neil Fishburne, is also a servant officer. He's been away on leave for a couple of days and not contactable, but he's expected back tonight. I think she's heading for York, said Stacy. Most women would go home in her position, especially if her fiancé is due back. The chief stood up. I'm going to give the NCA a ring, see if there'll be any more forthcoming with me. If this woman's involved in something, said Ajax, she could be going anywhere. Exactly. And while we believe she's still on our patch, we're well within our rights to look for her, the chief said. 
I want to know about it if she uses her phone or any of her credit cards. And I want the guys in the CCTV room watching out for her. Pay special attention to the train and bus stations. If she's deliberately trying to stay under the radar, she'll know all those tricks, sir, said Stacy. I think we should concentrate our efforts on York. Fair enough, the chief said. Get on to North Yorkshire. Ask them to keep a close eye on her house. If they're stretched, we'll send someone down. All our spare officers are at St. James Park the night, said Ajax. The chief looked weary. Ah, oh, I'd forgotten that. OK, we rely on North Yorkshire. I think you're right, Stacy. I think she will be heading for York. Chapter 66 His mother's voice always sounded older on the phone. Patrick could hear the tar that lined her lungs scrabbling up towards her throat. I don't like it, Pat. None of this makes any sense, she was saying. If she's a police officer, why hasn't she been in touch with them, hmm? Even if she didn't have a phone. Because some thieving git nicked them all. She could have walked to the nearest house. I don't know more, he said, because he knew he had to say something. Nobody does. He looked at his watch. Well past midday already. What was she doing in the balloon? Surveillance? God bless us and save us the things she might have seen from that balloon. Get a grip, Ma. No one uses balloons for surveillance. You can't steer them. Why hasn't she phoned someone, said, Oi, I'm in a bit of a fix, can you give me a lift? He was tapping his fingers on the steering wheel now. Oh, good question, Ma. If I can ever get going, maybe I'll ask her. He wouldn't. Conversation didn't play a major part in his plan for Jessica Bloody Lane. So where's she going? He sighed and swallowed his first response. York, they think. He revved the engine, but quietly. No point asking for it. You don't have time to go to York. Have you forgotten what's happening tonight? I'll be back. What if you get held up? I won't. And they're asking questions about that girl we took in yesterday morning. I told you this would happen. We should have stopped when... Ma, I've really got to get going. Just bloody make sure you're back. He killed the call, pulled away and turned onto the A1, heading south. Chapter 67 Two years, three months earlier. Jess, are you mad? You went into that dreadful place by yourself. You could have been killed. Isabel was some feet away in the convent's peacock enclosure, Jessica waiting in the entrance. In nearly twenty years of visiting, she'd never got used to being so close to the admittedly beautiful but huge and sometimes downright aggressive birds. Isabel right now was surrounded by them, males, females, chicks, all clamouring for their food. I would never have got permission to go, so who could I take with me? And it's not so bad. There's crime there, of course, and abuse, but killing an English woman really wouldn't help their cause, and they know that. And you can talk. You're about to get bitten. Isabel looked down. One of the peahens was inches away from her right hand. She threw a handful of pellets and the birds moved away. Their cause being to get to England, she said, throwing more. Yep. I was gambling on my nationality working for me. They all want a friend in England. English? You English? The youngsters approached her first, as she'd expected. She had small packets of sweets and crayons to bribe them. The adults watched from behind their tent curtains and lopsided doors, curious, suspicious, ready to act if she posed the least threat. 
or showed any weakness. When she watched TV footage of the jungle in Calais, the people who lived there always looked as though they were wading through mud. Because they were, she realised now, as her feet got stuck and she nearly lost her boots again. There was a main street of sorts, a ribbon clearing in the tents, shacks and shelters, along which travelled stolen bicycles and four-wheel drive news vehicles. Narrower paths forked off from it, like branches from a diseased tree, sprouting homes on either side. In the distance she could see the cheap wooden cross of a church. There was a mosque here too, and shops and a school was being built. Here, in this dreadful place, an infrastructure of sorts had formed. "'I want to talk to your mother,' she said, to young face after young face. "'Does your mother speak English? Or German? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Polska? I want to ask your mother some questions.' One of the older children was poking at her rucksack, trying to see what was inside. She turned and faced him, shaking her head. I speak good English. Where in England you live? He was about sixteen, his eyes red-rimmed, one of them with a swollen, angry sty. I live in York, in the north. She waited for a reaction. None came. Also in London. London! London! It became a chorus around them. We want to go to London! More people joined them, mainly teenagers, some young men. Jessica reached into the large pocket of her coat and pulled out the photographs. She turned the pile so that her new friend could see the top one. His eyes narrowed and he took a step back. Do you know anyone who has done this? She looked from one set of brown eyes to the next, letting them all see the photograph of Mohammed's angry infected wound. You? She spoke directly to the boy who was backing away now. She pointed at his back. Have you done this? You want by kidney? Another voice this time. A young man. No. She thought for a second, decided it was worth the risk, and pulled out her warrant card. I'm an English police officer. She waited for them to scatter, to behave the way crowds invariably did when confronted by the police, but none of them moved. She could do nothing to harm them. The French police, they might fear, but she was still an English citizen, one who might hold the key to the promised land. Someone is hurting people like you. Someone is stealing from you. I want to find who. The man beckoned. He wanted her to follow him. They left the track, weaving between tents, ducking beneath lines strewn with dirty clothes, stepping over rubbish, sensing eyes watching them at every turn. She passed dark huts from which Arabic rock music blared, and pools of filth that nearly made her wretch. When she looked back, she could no longer see the main street, just a crooked line of blue tents and precarious huts, and the crowd bigger now that was following her. For the first time, the people in her wake weren't mainly children. Her guide stopped suddenly, beside a shelter made from wooden pallets covered with waterproof sheeting and wide strips of clear plastic. He called in a language she didn't recognise. From inside came a grunt, then a rustling. A face appeared. A black man, his tight black curls streaked with grey. There were deep wrinkles at his temples and on his forehead. He was thin, dressed for winter rather than a rainy day in June. The conversation continued. One man was pointing at the other's body, then tapping his own roughly where a kidney scar might be. Jessica held up her photograph, saw the older man's eyes narrow. This for him too, said the guide. He speak no English. I help. Jessica pulled her rucksack from her shoulders. 
she found two packets of paracetamol and held them out. She'd brought sweets for the children, over-the-counter medical supplies for the adults. He has a scar like this? she asked. The older man took the packets. The younger one said, Yes, scar like that. I need to know who took it, where and when. The to and fro of rapid conversation went on for several minutes. Then her guide turned back. He is from Eritrea. You know this place? Jessica nodded. I do. He was travelling with his family. Wife, three children. Two brothers. Brother's wife. His mother. They came across the sea, then by land. Very expensive trip. Many thousands of dollars. How did he pay for it? Her guide pointed at the photograph still in Jessica's hand. That way. His family, too? She tried to see inside the gloom of the Eritrean man's home. Are they here? No, just him and his mother. He pointed inside the shelter, and Jessica bent to peer into the darkness. Sitting on an upturned box at the back, wrapped in shawls and blankets, was a figure topped with a brown, wrinkled face. They travelled to Belgium. The family went on ship. Not him, not his mother. Why? He was sick. The... the... He struggled for the word, pointed to the photographs again. The operation? suggested Jessica. To remove his kidney? It make him sick. Fever, weak. They say he too sick. They not let him on boat. They leave him behind. And mother, uh, they come here. The older man interrupted with a flurry of words. He say all he want to do now is get to England and find his family. I'll look for them, Jessica said. If he tells me their names, maybe shows me a photograph, I promise I'll look for them. He say, you must look in the north. His family were taken to the north, and this makes him very afraid, because he knows the north is a terrible place. The north again, said Isabel. She was surrounded by the birds now as she emptied the tub of pellets into the feeders. Not just the north, a place called Yellow House. This man believes his family have been taken to a place called Yellow House in the north of England. Yellow House? What's that? Standing upright again, she put the lid on the feeder. No idea. I assumed it was a town or city name that he'd misheard. Or an actual Yellow House? Jessica rubbed a hand over her face. Oh, wish me luck with tracking that down. Isabel moved out of the pen, leaving the door wedged open. Behind her, the peafowl were intent upon their food. Soon, though, their meal would be over, and they'd start roaming the convent grounds again. I can't believe you never lose these things, Jessica said. Don't foxes get them? We do lose them. Peafowl have a tendency to run wild if allowed, even if they're born in captivity. And they can fend for themselves quite well. They eat just about anything and roost in trees. We lost pea soup for three months once. Then she turned up one afternoon in chapel right as rain. Why don't you keep them locked up? Oh, we lock ourselves up. Why should they suffer too? Jessica said nothing. Isabel, as usual when she let slip what Jessica believed were her real feelings about the convent, would not meet her eyes. Then she looked up and seemed to force a smile. And now, for once, I have something to tell you. I've been in big trouble with Hilda. Sister, what are you doing in here? The desktop computer gave a last ping as it closed down. Its feeble light disappeared and the room was cloaked in shadows. Isabel, behind Mother Hildegard's desk, considered her options. They were few. Hildegard was standing in the doorway. 
Short of leaping from the window, there was no way out of the room without physical violence. She walked around to the front of the desk. I admit my fault, Mother Hildegard. I will willingly do penance. Hildegard's brows flicked upwards. I don't doubt it, but you haven't answered my question. Isabel tried again. I have allowed my thoughts to be diverted from God. I will pray he forgives my weakness. She dropped her eyes to the carpet and began counting threads. I'm not going to let this go, sister. What were you doing in my office in the middle of the night? As if on cue, the chapel bell began to ring, and two low musical sounds sped around the convent building. It was two o'clock in the morning. I was searching for something on the internet, Isabel said. I'm all ears. Isabel risked looking up. Mother Hildegard hadn't bothered dressing. She was wearing an old brown dressing gown and a thin cotton cap over her hair. Without the flowing black robes, the bumps, nobbles and angles of an elderly woman were much more visible. This would be her, Isabel realised in thirty years' time. Old and lumpy, grey and dry. Excuse me, mother, she said. I would prefer not to say. Sister, do I have to remind you, again, that you took a vow of obedience? Isabel sighed. I was curious about something that Jessica is investigating. I wanted to know more about it. I found a report and printed it off to read later. Hildegard leaned back, nodding gently. Ah, Jessica, I sometimes think we'd all be much better off without that young woman's frequent visits. And yet we'd miss her so much. Isabel waited. It helped sometimes having a relative who was such an obvious favourite with the convent leader. Hildegard shook her head. Well, I am unlikely to sleep again now, and I feel an unusual thirst, she said. Sister, I suggest we go quietly to the kitchens and put the kettle on. You can tell me all about it. I wanted to find out what happens in other countries, Isabel said to Hildegard once they were sitting at the small kitchen table, two mugs of steaming tea in front of them. I thought it might help Jessica. She has so little time. This isn't something she's working on officially. I thought I'd... You thought you, with so much time, could help the woman who has none. Do I need to remind you, sister, that time here is given for a purpose? Your time and mine, and that of all the sisters, belongs to God. I'm sorry. You know this, and yet the hours hang heavy on you, don't they? I often ask myself if God is enough for you. Isabel looked up from her mug. I can't leave. Elderly eyes stared. Why? Because you belong? Or because you've been here so long you've lost track of where you might go? Isabel said nothing. Hildegard sighed. And there are really parts of the world where the poor will sell their kidneys to feed their families. Kidneys and parts of the liver, replied Isabel. The liver can grow back, apparently, if you cut it in two. And yes, it may be to feed their families. It may be to settle debt, or even, as Jessica suspects, to pay people smugglers the cost of a trip to the West. And I know that sounds horrible, but the stuff I found is right. It's not only kidneys that are traded. Organs are taken that people can't survive without. The heart, for example. Hildegard crossed herself. In some countries, doctors have special authority to remove organs from unclaimed bodies. And, conveniently, a lot of unclaimed bodies turn up at the hospitals where these doctors work. In others, political prisoners are used as live donors. I found stories about people still breathing after their organs were removed, but being thrown into the incinerators anyway. Sister, 
I'm not sure either of us will sleep soundly for some time to come. But did you find anything that may actually help Jessica? I don't think so. I suppose I was hoping that I might have a brainwave about how it could be happening in the UK. But everything here seems so tightly regulated. I can't see how it's possible. We should hope and pray that it isn't. Hildegard drained her mug and put it down. I think it's time for me to get ready for Lord, sister. She stood and looked around. I've thought for a few days now that the windows in here are looking grimy. Perhaps you'd like to spend the rest of the dark hours letting in a bit more light. And that was it, Jessica said. She made you clean the windows. As they'd finished feeding the peacocks, rain had started to fall, and the two women had found refuge in the convent greenhouses. Huge, long and elaborate Victorian constructions, the greenhouses ran almost the full length of the rear of the convent building. In the past, they'd been used exclusively for growing food. While some foodstuffs, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, were still grown, seeds from outside had found their way in and flourished. Huge, unruly plants in the beds and larger tubs gave a rainforest feel to the greenhouses on warm, wet days. Ah, oh, if only! Isabel gave a mock sigh. I had to make a public confession, where I explained everything I'd learned to the sisters, and asked them to join my prayers that the cruel and ungodly practice can be ended. We prayed for the victims, for the forgiveness of those who exploit their fellow men, and for the courage and strength of all those who are working to protect the vulnerable. Special prayers were said for you, of course. We've done a great deal of praying on the subject. Well, I'm rather surprised we still have a problem. But good to know I've got a convent of crime-fighting nuns on my side. Not to mention God. Jessica gave her sister a sideways look. But Isabel looked perfectly serious. A rustling from behind made them both jump. Jessica got up from the iron bench to see a bunch of large tropical leaves shivering. Something or someone was close by, listening to their conversation. Hello? she said. I'm not sure which of us will be most surprised if you get an answer, Isabel said. That'll be Peanut. The leaves moved again. Something seemed to be making its way out of the leaves towards them. Possibly Pea Brain, Isabel went on. But Pea Nut is the one we find in here most often, especially when it's raining. The foliage parted, and a small sharp head appeared a foot from the soil. A bird's head, the most perfect shade of blue imaginable a regal tuft of blue, flower-like feathers standing up from its crown. Deep brown eyes looked into Jessica's for a second, before the peacock emerged completely and walked past her down the path. The turquoise feathers of its tail, adorned with a hundred unblinking eyes, trailed behind it as its feet tapped on the stone flags. Hmm, peanut, confirmed Isabel. Don't tell me you can tell them apart, Jessica said. Of course, we all can. Even Sister Serapis, and she's practically blind. She says they have a different cry. The peacock looked back briefly, before leaving the path again and disappearing behind a row of tomato plants. Its tail remained visible, a shimmering mass of blue and turquoise feathers, twitching occasionally. I tell you what, though. Isabel said. If Hilda had realised how interested that lot were going to be, she'd have made me burn that report and never mention a word to anyone. They can't talk about anything else. We don't watch American sitcoms anymore at recreation. We search for documentaries about organ trafficking. Sister Serapis wanted chapter and verse on how much various organs cost on the black market, and actually argued with me for ten minutes that a liver should be worth more than a heart because a liver clears the body of all the ill humours. 
Sister Alfreda has offered her kidney to pay for repairs to the chapel roof. And Sister Tabitha insists I tell you that you have to, her words now, stake out Whitby. Because there's always been something dodgy about Whitby since Dracula landed. Jessica sat back down on the bench. I'm living in a budget sequel to Sister Act. Oh, and Sister Eugenia has asked me to speak to you specifically. She seems to think there's some sort of national police computer system that records all crimes. Jessica sighed. Ah, she's probably thinking of homes. The Home Office Large Major Inquiry System. She thought you could search it. Type in black people and organ trafficking with a plus symbol. She was very clear about that. Apparently her nephew is studying computer science at university. Well, I know what she means. I did actually run a search when this first came up. Nothing. But maybe you need to keep doing it. Do it every week. Sooner or later you might get something. Bide your time. Be patient. Jessica was smiling. Funny, you were never the patient one of the family. Isabel looked through the glass at the walls of the convent building. Oh, I've had nearly two decades in this place. What else was I supposed to learn? Chapter 68 Thursday the 21st of September OK, people, Ajax said. We're talking about the accidental death, in possibly suspicious circumstances, of a young woman known as Tamina Farah, who was admitted to Newcastle General yesterday morning. Round about the time the first fatalities from the balloon crash were arriving, although I'm sure that's coincidence. D.C. Chapman, you've got our attention. Steve Chapman? at the front of the meeting room, rose to his feet. So, I've spoken to Northern Area, who dealt with the accident initially. Talmina was found lying at the foot of some small cliffs just off Howick. Found by who? Ajax asked. Early morning jogger. Couple of dog walkers were soon on scene too. No one saw her fall, and they weren't sure at first whether she was alive or dead. They called an ambulance and local uniform attended as a matter of routine. She was rushed to Newcastle. Shortly after she arrived, a couple of male relatives pitched up. Chapman glanced down at his notes. Er, uh, Mohammed Farah. No relation to the athlete that I know of. And an Abdul Bari, he went on. Farah was a next of kin and he gave permission for the machines to be turned off and her organs to be used. Around the room, a couple of officers were making notes. Most, though, were watching Chapman, slightly puzzled frowns on their faces. This is where it gets interesting. Chapman had obviously sensed the waning attention. Moore and Abdul left the hospital, having collected all the necessary details about arranging the funeral and vanished. When I tried to contact them following the concern expressed by the two doctors, the phone numbers were unobtainable. There is a Farah family living at the address they gave, and it does include a young woman called Tamina, but she was looking pretty hale and hearty when I showed up. None of them knew anything at all about the accident yesterday, and no young women belonging to the family are missing. Identity theft? someone said. Did they kill her? Another asked. On a killing or a, or a bad accident? Maybe, said Chapman. But why turn up at the hospital? Why go through the rigmarole of organ donation? And why with fake identities? Chappers, presumably this Moe and Abdul will be coming back to Newcastle General to collect the body, Ajax said. They won't know anything about our involvement yet. When are they expected? Sometime today. I'll get some plain clothes officers in there, said Ajax. When they show up, nab them. 
Not you, though, chappers. In fact, I want you to hand it over to Charlie and let him take it forward. I need you on the hunt for Jessica Lane. As Chapman sat down, Ajax got to his feet. This woman, Jessica Lane, should have died, he said. Eleven people were killed in that crash. Not only did Lane survive, she walked away, and she's still walking. So I want to know where she's going. I want to know why she hasn't been in touch, why she isn't seeking help, why she's deliberately avoiding the police. I want to know who she's running from. Most of all, I want her found. Chapter 69 The Tudor-fronted, narrow, cobbled streets of the old city of York were busy. Its shops gaudy and rich, like a trail of discarded Christmas presents. Everywhere she went it seemed that bells rang out. People called to each other. Traffic roared past. From every open doorway came a new smell. Tropical perfumes, roasting meat, burning sugar. After the isolation of the National Park, the quiet, steady purpose of the small Northumbrian towns, the size and speed and sound of York came as a shock to the senses. She crossed the River Ouse at Micklegate Bridge, glad of the double coat now, because York was cold. Further inland than Berwick-upon-Tweed, and the warming effect of the sea, the city held chill winds around every corner. With the hood of the blue coat around her head, keeping to the narrow old streets where there would be fewer cameras, knowing that a woman alone would be more conspicuous because that's who the police were looking for, she moved from one group of tourists to the next, even following a guided tour for a few hundred metres. Paranoid about being seen, she hadn't taken the direct route from the station, heading instead into the city, wandering the old streets, as though trying to shake off a tale she knew couldn't possibly be there. The sense of being followed, of being hunted, was growing stronger by the second. As a nearby church was striking four o'clock, she reached the street that faced the southwestern stretch of the old city wall. She stood on the corner for several minutes, knowing that police vehicles came in all shapes and sizes. After ten minutes, she slipped into the alley that ran between two terraces. At the eleventh door along, she stopped and looked round. No one about. She ran at the wall, finding footholds, scrambling up and then over. The bin on the other side broke her fall. The space at the back was half garden, half empty dog pen. The two German shepherds that shared the house with its human occupants were in boarding kennels. She made her way past the statue of the weeping nun, over a tiny lawn and unlocked the back door. Neil? she called. Hello? Although she already felt sure the house was empty. She took off her shoes, removed and hung up both jackets, drank water straight from the tap and nearly a pint of milk from the fridge. She would have eaten and drunk more but found nothing fresh, only a square of cheese that had dried and cracked, some bacon and a few limp vegetables. The fridge said as clearly as did the silent house that no one was home. No one had been home for several days now. Dishes and cutlery on the draining board were bone dry. A large kitchen knife had been used to open a brown envelope, but the postmark was several days ago. The knife was perilously close to the edge of the counter. The strong breeze might send it spinning to the floor. She picked it up and put it down again on top of the envelope. On the worktop, by the bread bin, was a wholesale pack of Reese's peanut butter cups. At the sight of them, she caught hold of the kitchen counter to steady herself, and laid her head against the cool melamine of the cupboard. It was odd, the stuff that she could deal with, and the things that might just break her. The curtains in the living room were open, 
touching nothing, moving nothing, keeping hold of the rucksack, she moved through the ground floor to the hallway and then upstairs. She needed a bath, clean clothes and some time to rest in a warm place before they came looking. At the top of the stairs she walked past three closed doors into the main bedroom and then the ensuite bathroom. The bathroom was faux Victorian, the walls lined with tongue and groove panelling, painted a soft creamy pink. A huge roll-top bath with clawed feet took up most of the space. On the shelf between the hand basin and the mirror was a thin stick of white plastic on which two tiny windows each showed a thin blue line. She picked it up. Couldn't see it properly because she was crying again. Clutching it tight, she walked back into the bedroom, lay down on the bed and pressed the remote control that would turn on the small TV. It took her a few minutes to find the BBC news channel. The man she'd seen on TV that morning Superintendent Ajax Maldonado was standing outside the police station in Newcastle. We now have reason to believe that Jessica Lane survived the balloon crash and could be in urgent need of medical assistance. Maldonado was good at speaking to the camera, with none of the over-formal delivery that most self-conscious police officers fall into. She may be suffering from a condition called acute stress disorder. She may not even have any clear recollection of what happened. He paused and glanced down at something in his hands. Any member of the public seeing Jessica shouldn't approach her. In her confused state of mind, she could be a danger to herself and others, but should contact the police immediately. A photograph appeared on the screen, the same one she'd been seeing all day on TV screens. A young woman, with dark hair, wearing a bright green jacket. Then Maldonado was back. Running along the bottom of the screen was a telephone number for the public to call. "'Where do you think she is?' called a reporter out of shot, as a big furry microphone was pushed closer towards Maldonado. "'Why hasn't she contacted the police?' another called. Maldonado nodded his thanks and headed back into the building. She lay back on the pillow and caught a whiff of a musky, masculine scent. Neil. Chapter 70 Two Years Earlier You don't think you're getting a bit, I don't know, obsessed? Jessica spun her chair round to see Neil in the doorway, naked but for his boxers, red in the face and damp around the chest hair. Neil always turned into an inferno at night. She still wasn't used to waking up in sheets wet from his sweat. Sorry, she said. Go back to bed. He didn't. He came further into the room and turned her back to face the screen. She reached up, found his hands on her shoulders, and they looked together at the map of the north of England. There was a story on the radio when I was driving up, she said. A young woman in Newcastle is dying of liver disease. She's got days to live without a transplant. None of her close family is a match. She needs a donor, probably tonight. His fingers strayed towards her neck. It was on the local news as well. She had a big family, colourful bunch, Catholics, said they were praying for a miracle. But a miracle for them is a tragedy for someone else. It just felt so creepy, as though someone had to die tonight so that she could live. And it could have been me. The M1 was busy. You know what those lorries can be like. All the way up, I was half waiting for something to happen. OK, now I know you're taking this too far. A dark shape crept into the room. A huge German shepherd bitch. One of two that lived in the house with them. She moved across the carpet and pressed close to Neil's side. He took one hand off Jessica's shoulder 
to reach down and scratch behind the dog's ear. There's no good news with organ donation, Jessica said. Every time an organ becomes available, someone has died. A family somewhere is grieving. These people are dying anyway. The two aren't connected. Hmm. What if they are? Neil gave an exaggerated sigh. Jess, you've got the half-remembered anecdote of a dying man and some rumours about immigrants being frightened of the northern ports. That's it. He leaned over and shut the computer down. You've combed through statistics and found nothing. You've talked to the authorities and they've all told you it's impossible. There's nothing there. I know. And here was me thinking you'd be worried about the new job. She reached across for her wine glass and drained it. Well, I'm worried about that too. Or about moving in with me and the girls. She glanced down and met a pair of brown canine eyes. I'm not worried about that. Really? Because they get pretty jealous. Mm, so long as they don't expect to share the bed. He pulled her up, turned her to face the door. Speaking of bed... Gently he pushed her from the room. The dog tried to follow and was turned back at the bedroom door. Chapter 71 Thursday the 21st of September Patrick sat back down, his heart still thumping. He didn't like Agro. Well, not unless he'd started it in the first place. Over at the bar, the couple of lads who'd tried to switch the TV to Channel 4 for the racing were muttering to each other. The bloke behind it was polishing a glass his eyes fixed on the bar. No one was looking directly at Patrick, but he knew he was being watched all the same. Don't get yourself noticed, you idiot. He could hear his mother's voice as clearly as if she'd been in the room. It had been wasted effort anyway. The news item was finishing, and Maldonado walking back into the station. Jessica Lane of York. A woman confused. A danger to herself and others. A woman in a bright green jacket. His hand was shaking. He picked up his drink and let the smell of it wash into him. Sometimes this was enough. Not this time. The pint of beer on the table in front of him was untouched. He didn't like beer. The beer was for show, and to discourage any hints from the staff that he might leave. It was the double whisky chaser he needed, more than ever now. On his phone he opened up the photographs of Jessica Lane that Jimmy had found for him earlier on the internet. A different shot to the one the police were using. In the photograph he'd been looking at all day, she wasn't wearing the green jacket. Hmm. Something was seriously fucked up. He tried making a phone call got number busy. He even thought about phoning his mother. He finished his whiskey and then drank the beer. Chapter 72 Sir, something you need to see. No sleep in twenty-four hours was catching up with Ajax. He picked his head up off the desk and focused on chappers in the doorway. What is it? he asked. Finley called me a couple of minutes ago. I think he's right, but you need to look as well. Finley from IT stepped forward, and both men came into the room. I ran Jessica Lane's photograph through the facial recognition system, like you said, he told Ajax. It's thrown up something very interesting. I've sent you an email. He leaned over Ajax's computer and opened his inbox. There you go. Image captured three days ago at 18.30 hours. The still picture showed HQ's reception area. Sergeant's desk, notice boards, visitors' chairs. 
Three people were coming in through the revolving doors. The one in the middle, Finley said. I've blown it up as much as I can. Ajax leaned forward. The three people in the shot wore tabard aprons over their clothes. They were employees of the contract cleaning company that came into the building every evening as the day shift ended. The one in the middle, Chappers repeated. Ajax rubbed his eyes. The cleaner in the middle of the group was a slim woman in her thirties, about five foot seven and a hundred and ten pounds. Her dark hair was scraped back into a high ponytail. We found her a few times, said Finlay, but she nearly always keeps her head down, as though she's checked out where the cameras are and is avoiding them. This is the only time she looks up. Ajax shook his head. I'm not sure. Thought she might say that. So compare this image taken earlier this afternoon at Berwick Railway Station. Another image flashed up. This time the woman's hair was loose, dark and curly, flying out around her face in an unruly mess. The face, though, was the same. Ajax looked at Chappers. Have you shown anyone else this? No, sir. We brought it straight to you. Do you think it's Jessica Lane? Oh, I'm sure it is, said Ajax. The question is, who and what in this building was she investigating? Chapter 73 A dog barking in the street woke her. She sat upright on the bed, hot and breathless but the bark was high-pitched, suggesting a small dog, not the one that was looking for her. The house had grown dark while she'd been sleeping. Still holding the thin white strip, she got up, straightened the duvet out of habit, and then replaced the plastic strip on the bathroom shelf before turning on the bath taps. Back in the bedroom, it took her a few minutes to find hiking trousers, a cotton sweater and a larger fleece, underwear and socks. Her filthy clothes went into the linen basket. A few more seconds of searching, and she found Neil's mobile phone in his top drawer, where he'd said it would be. Leaving it on top of the cabinet, where she'd see it when she left the room, she found a robe behind the bathroom door, picked up the rucksack and then walked back along the landing. The smallest spare bedroom had been converted into a home office. In the bottom drawer of the desk cabinet, she knew she'd find more cash. Three hundred pounds. It went into the rucksack. On the desk was a laptop. I'm sending Neil the password for my laptop. Lots of important stuff on there. An entire investigation one that had taken so much time and energy these past two years, was detailed on this laptop, and only on this laptop. She tucked the thin computer into her rucksack, looked around for a power lead and took that too. Back in the bathroom she took off her robe. The bath was surrounded by heavy shower curtains, creating a capsule of sweet-scented steam that she stepped into. There had to be a dozen or more scratches and bruises on her body, some of them caked in dried blood, and she cried out as the water made them sting. She sat down, clenched her teeth and picked up the soap. After a while her wound stopped hurting. The warm water, the steam, the darkness, were making her drowsy even before she'd soaked her skin and washed her hair. She dozed off while the soap bubbles were still glistening on the water in front of her. The sound of the front door opening woke her. It slammed, shaking the entire house. She heard footsteps striding along the tiled hall. Heavy steps, the thud of low heels. Neil was home. This was not how she wanted to be found. She pushed herself up trying not to disturb the water, not to make any sound. She swung one leg over the side before the water began to drip from her body and grabbed a towel. 
the sound of a second set of footsteps, this time shrill and clipped, stopped her. Someone with high heels was following Neil along the hall. With the bathroom door open a fraction, she could hear the rustling of coats being removed, of shoes being pulled off, then voices, confirming what she'd already guessed. Neil was downstairs, talking to a woman. And that woman was not a policewoman, because police officers did not remove their shoes when they entered people's houses. She heard the suction of the fridge door, the chink of glasses, the sound of liquid being poured, and became acutely conscious of her own nakedness. She pulled on underwear, the trousers and cotton top, the thick socks, and had barely made herself presentable when they reached the top of the stairs. She put her hand on the bathroom door. I shouldn't be here, said the female voice. She could turn up any time. As though the steam in the bathroom were amplifying sound, she heard the clink of glass on a hard surface, a wardrobe door being opened. If she turns up, she turns up, Neil said. I'm done sneaking around. Can we not talk about this for the rest of the evening? The sound of him drawing the curtains. Seems a bit brutal, said the female. She's just lost her sister. Not to mention. Yeah, I know. Silence in the bedroom. I should go, said the female. The bed springs creaked. She won't come here, said Neil. She'll head for that convent. That's obviously where she was going when they saw her in Wooler. She's always been close to those nuns. Wouldn't be surprised if she joins them herself one of these days. The bed springs creaked again. Neil, we can't. Not now. No, I'm serious. Even behind the bathroom door, she could hear clothing being pulled off and the quiet whimpers people make when they're kissing. She heard the bed protest again as they moved on it. Holding her breath, she stepped to the door and through its gap caught a glimpse of the two people on the bed. Neil was still in his jeans, his torso and feet bare. The female was in red underwear. Clothes lay strewn across the carpet. On the cabinet by the door was a bottle of red wine and a glass. The phone was behind the bottle. If the woman had put the bottle down, Neil might not have seen his phone immediately behind it. He wouldn't have seen that she'd moved it. The woman in the red underwear who was slim with curly dark hair, had stopped moving. What was that? she said. Neil was kissing the side of her neck. What was what? I heard something. Neil's head tilted upwards to reach the woman's ear. She half pushed him away. Neil, I think there's someone downstairs. He pushed back. Not possible. No, it wasn't possible. The intruder, the peeping Tom, was upstairs, in the ensuite bathroom, trying to pluck up enough courage to come out and say what needed to be said. There couldn't be another one downstairs. Could there? Suddenly very afraid, she stepped back away from the bathroom door. I thought I heard the back door. The woman on the bed insisted. She is Jessica. She hadn't locked the back door. I think you should check. I can't walk downstairs. I'm so frigging hard. Feel this. A soft giggle, more subdued moaning. The police, if they traced her, wouldn't enter a house surreptitiously through the back door. They'd knock, loud and insistent, at the front. And she could hear something too now. A quiet step as someone climbed the stairs. A gasp from the woman in the bedroom, sharp and shrill. Not quite a scream. What? Neil said. What have I done? <coughs> a 
choking sound from Neil. Low, terrified wailing from his partner. The sense of being removed from reality grew with every step she took. From the bedroom came more sounds, none of them reassuring. She stretched her neck to see into the room through the inch-wide gap. In the bedroom, not two metres from where she stood, was Patrick Farr. He'd taken off his leather jacket, his trilby, and wore instead a simple white T-shirt. A rosary had been pushed around on his neck, so that the cross hung down his back. There was a Celtic cross tattooed on his right bicep. The plaited hair bracelet she'd noticed in the hay barn last night was on his left wrist, where most men would wear a watch. In his gloved right hand he held a knife, with a gleaming red blade. At his feet lay the green jacket that half the country was on the lookout for, the one he'd found downstairs. She couldn't see much beyond him, just the edges of the bed, and for that she was grateful. She could hear, though, the terrified wailing of the woman, and a silence from Neil that was so much worse. Far moved, not taking his eyes off the bed, but edging closer to the bedroom door, as though to head off the woman's potential escape. Neil was lying face down, motionless. He had to be dead. No one could lose that much blood and not be dead. It covered the bed, covered the half-naked woman huddled up against the pillows, had leapt high into the air to reach the walls, the ceiling, even the curtains. Far had cut through the main artery in Neil's neck. Nothing else could explain how much blood he'd lost so quickly. He'd sneaked into the bedroom while the two of them were distracted, grasped Neil by the hair and sliced his throat almost in two. And now he was taking his time, staring at the rear view of the woman who was scrambling away, across the bed, down onto the carpet. Her legs wouldn't hold her up. She was clutching at the curtains, as though about to fling herself through the glass of the window. Far left the doorway, strode around the bed, carefully avoiding the blood that was already pooling on the carpet. Screams rang out as he caught hold of the woman by her hair. She fell to her knees, twisting away from him. He thought the woman in the bedroom was her. He thought he was killing her. She felt hard enamel pressing against the back of her knees as the screams stopped suddenly. She edged around the back of the tub to the sound of the woman keening. No, no, please, God, no! The roll-top bath was freestanding some six inches from the adjacent wall. By the time the last choking sound broke out, she'd stolen into the tiny space between them and was counting on the voluminous shower curtain to hide her. Closing her eyes tight, she willed herself to stay upright, to breathe steadily, not to ruffle the curtain. People would have heard. There were houses either side. The walls couldn't be thick enough to disguise the sound of so much screaming. Neighbours would be looking at each other in surprise, in alarm. Silence from the bedroom. In the bathroom, a shrill, tiny splash, as a drop of moisture fell from the curtain into the bathwater. The bathroom door was pulled open. The bedroom light framed his silhouette in the doorway. She could make out his head, his shoulders, even the knife. He seemed to be looking directly at her. She heard his step on the tiles, the rustle of the curtains at the other side of the bath as he pushed them aside. She heard the water move as he dipped his hand into the bath, checking its temperature. She heard him inhale a long, deep breath. He turned. She heard him cross the bedroom, step heavily downstairs, and then leave the house through the back door. Chapter 74 The steam-filled room, already dark, seemed to be losing light. From the bedroom came a soft, low sound, 
On hearing it, she squeezed out from behind the bath. She would call an ambulance, use basic first aid, if it could be of any help at all. In the distance, sirens sounded. They might be nothing to do with her. They might be heading this way. She had to be sure. She would find a phone. The bedroom was still dimly lit. Neil was lying face down on the bed. The woman was at its foot, collapsed over the green jacket, the wound on her throat gaping open like a hungry mouth. Neither looked alive. That sound again. She watched a bubble of blood form in the woman's wound. It grew bigger and burst. This woman wasn't alive. It was her dead body making these noises. The knife Far had used lay on the pale grey carpet like a Halloween prop, although it had probably once been a normal kitchen knife. It was a normal kitchen knife. It had opened a brown envelope downstairs and then been left close to the worktop edge. She touched it herself never dreaming the use to which it would soon be put. How did he keep finding her? How did he always know where she was? Another sound from behind. The wine bottle had been knocked over, was spilling out from the chest of drawers to the carpet. The glass Neil had been drinking from was blood-spattered. So was his watch. His mobile phone was gone. She looked back at the dead people, the blood-stained room, the knife on the carpet, a knife with her fingerprints on it. She saw the green jacket half hidden beneath the dead woman. She'd worn that jacket practically non-stop since early yesterday morning, and now it was covered in another woman's blood. The siren was drawing closer. She grabbed the rucksack, heavier now that it contained the laptop. Downstairs she pulled on hiking boots and a large jacket of Neil's. On impulse, she snatched up a packet of the peanut butter cups and shoved them into a pocket. The torch beam caught her as she stepped into the alleyway. Police, stay where you are. Chapter 75 Patrick sat in his van, spraying antiseptic on his hands and wiping them with tissues. He'd found a little carrier bag in his glove compartment, and he dropped the soiled tissues and his blood-stained T-shirt inside it. He'd have liked to dump it in the street, even find a waste bin, but knew he was still too close to the house. It would be found. He reached behind and found a sweater he'd brought from home when he'd had a feeling the day might get messy. He'd barely started the engine when he heard the siren. Fifty metres away, a police car. Lights flashing, siren blaring, crossed the top of the street. Then another. He opened his window a couple of inches and heard footsteps approaching fast. A woman appeared from a nearby alley running flat out. He recognised the hair straight away, the face a second later. This was Jessica Lane. How the hell? She paused for a second then ran right across the street, leaping up a wall and climbing a grassed bank. She was heading for the path that ran around the top of the city wall. A third police car passed him and turned into the street ahead. A few more seconds and a police officer yelling into a radio ran out of the alley. He stopped, hands on his knees, to get his breath, then jogged to the street corner and shone his torch around. He found the woman already almost at the top of the bank, and set off after her. Lane reached the wall at the top of the bank and set off along the perimeter path, heading north towards the city. Patrick knew the city of York. He knew the walls. He knew the limited official exits and entrances. And he knew that when Lane reached Station Road, she'd almost certainly have to come down. He'd wait for her there. He started his engine turned round slowly in the road as though he hadn't a care in the world, and then gradually picked up speed as he drove towards the river, wondering who the fuck he'd just killed in the house. Chapter 76 She ran without thinking, away from the torchlight, along the back of the terraced row. Police! 
she didn't stop. Across the street she saw a large white transit van with a man in the driver's seat. Patrick Farr. She switched direction, ran across the street, over the low wall and onto the steep, grassed bank. Shouts below her told her to stop. Instead, she scrambled up and pulled herself to the top. Breathless, she reached the flagged footpath that ran along the upper reaches of the medieval stone wall. On one side was the grass bank she'd just scaled, on the other a sheer drop. Not far to the station. She could jump on a train, any train. Gulping in air, she set off, past the house, blue lights flashing in the corner of her eye, indistinct figures in high-vis jackets gathering, banging on the door, neighbouring houses spilling cold, curious occupants into the street. She risked a quick look back to see two men in uniform had scaled the bank. She ran faster, over Micklegate Bar, on towards the western corner. She spun round it and could see the grand brick station. No way down. Shouts from behind. Her pursuers weren't catching her up, but sooner or later she'd come to a dead end. After sunset, the wall was punctuated by locked gates. The police would radio ahead, have people waiting at the next gate. She had no choice but to get off the wall. She got ready to leap down and... At the last second, in the street directly below, saw the police car. She set off again, conscious of the police car keeping pace as the floodlit towers of the Minster came into sight. All she could do was run on, and yet ahead, blocking the path, was a black wrought iron gate, nearly six feet high, with the white rose of York embossed on a red plaque. No way past, except for those with nothing to lose. She reached the gate and took a hold of it, put her left foot on the old iron lock and jumped. Her right foot found the cross rail on the railings. Keeping hold of the gate for balance, she swung her body around and dropped down on the other side. She set off again, downhill this time, easier. Chapter 77 the phone rang while Ajax was watching the last few minutes of the ten o'clock news. He had a glass of scotch in his hand, the remains of a microwave dinner by his elbow. He'd been on the point of nodding off. The voice was unfamiliar. A woman, late forties, Yorkshire accent. Superintendent Maldonado? D.I. Dickinson from North Yorkshire. I understand you've been looking for a Jessica Lane. He was instantly awake again. We have, yes. She's here, in York. I'm standing outside her house now. I thought we had her car outside that house. Mojo had been lying on the sofa, her feet on Ajax's lap. He held one finger to his lips. Is she in custody? he asked. Not exactly. I'm sorry to tell you that she's dead. Interesting. I thought she'd last longer than that, said Mojo. Stabbed to death in her house, Dickinson was saying. Along with her fiancé, Neil Fishburne. Neighbour heard screams and called us out. The bodies were still warm when we arrived. So she went back home after all, said Mojo. Superintendent Maldonado? D.I. Dickinson was impatient, had other things to do. No, 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 you cannot go out again, said Mojo. I'm on my way, said Ajax. Chapter 78 Under the shadow of Station Road Bridge, Patrick trained his binoculars on the path. He thought he could see movement. A second later, he was sure of it. She'd made good time. She was both fit and fast. She seemed on the point of breaking off the high path, making for the street, but she turned and ran on. For a moment he felt sure she'd seen him. Then he spotted the police car cruising alongside the grassed bank. If she came down now, they'd pick her up. With some awe, he watched her scale the gate and realised there was actually a chance she'd get away. The police couldn't tell her any more in their car, because ahead of this point the wall moved away from the road. Their next chance to pick her up would be at the river. 
Obviously aware of this, the police car pulled on to Station Road and turned right towards the Minster. He'd be faster on foot. He jumped down, left the van where it was and ran for the bridge. The path ended at the river. She'd have to come down then. After a few metres, he was breathing heavily. Unlike Jessica Lane, he wasn't used to running. There was no sign of her on the bridge. The ewes was high after all the recent rain, and the squat, round Barker Tower, with its cone-shaped slate roof, was barely out of the water. Waves were lapping at the steps leading up to its raised door. The city wall at this point was turreted, elaborate. There were steps leading to the river, tiny alleys and dead ends. On the far side of the bridge, down near the water line, was a series of covered arches. Too many fricking hiding places. A police car passed him, pausing for a second in the traffic before moving on. The city ahead of him was busy with tourists, locals out for the evening, students, and the town centre bridges were always crowded. He tried to freeze out the people walking towards and away from him, looking for movement that stood out. She wouldn't be walking. She'd never have the nerve, not with the police after her. She'd be going faster than everyone else. Seeing nothing, he made his way across the river, checking quickly around the foundations of the Lendl Tower, continuing along Museum Street as the railing of the bridge gave way to a stone wall. Then he spotted a young couple on his side of the road, staring over the wall into the museum gardens. They looked at each other. The girl shrugged. They'd seen something. He heard heavy footsteps behind and stepped to one side to let the police run past. When they were out of sight at the opposite end of the bridge, he swung his legs over the park wall and dropped down. Instantly the city changed for him. Sounds were softened. The smell of petrol fumes and wet tarmac was replaced by that of vegetation and earth. Much of the light was gone. He was conscious of the river, very close, the huge medieval arches of the abbey ruins ahead, the Georgian splendour of the museum gardens. This wasn't a large park. So much the better. The hunt was on. He dropped to a crouch and took stock. There was still too much noise coming from the city for his hearing to be of much use. He'd have to rely upon spotting her. When fugitives knew the hunters were close, they hid, waiting for the danger to pass, giving themselves time to recover from the chase. Giving themselves time to recover from the chase. Then they ran again. She was somewhere in here, not too far away, hiding, waiting for her chance. He took a deep breath, willing his heartbeat to slow down then breathed in deeply again, trying to catch a whiff of the floral scent he remembered from the bathroom. He couldn't track people using scent, not like Shinto, but it helped him become familiar with his surroundings, and that was always useful. He had to keep out of sight too, though, in case the police came back. A double hunt. Leaving the shadow of the wall, he ran quickly, avoiding the path knowing the crunch of gravel would give him away. He ran to a large tree and stood behind it, so no one would see him from the road, and his dark clothes would blend in from the park side. He waited. She appeared after ten minutes, when he was beginning to think he'd missed her. Fifty metres further down the hill he caught sight of a slim figure dashing from a clump of bushes to round the back of the old building on the river's edge. He jogged down the hill after her, and stopped in the shadow of the building. It was Tudor-style, rectangular, with a high-pitched roof. The lower story was constructed of stone, the upper painted white with black beams. To his left, adjoining the main building, were much older ruins. Heading left, he passed through an archway in the ruined wall to find the river only metres in front of him. No sign of her. Staying close to the walls, he crept towards the water, peering around the corner. 
Nothing. He leaned back against the wall, staring up at the night sky, thinking about his next move, trying to predict hers. Coming in here was an odd thing to do. Unexpected. Losing pursuers would have been easier in the old streets of the city. Maybe she was intending to double back, head for the station or the bus terminal, and had leapt into the gardens because she knew about all the trees, the bushes, the hiding places, figuring this was the best place to lose someone without actually going very far. And she'd already thrown off the police. Smart girl. He liked hunting the smart ones. Then his smile widened. He knew where she was. A few metres from where he stood, no longer serving any useful purpose but kept because of their historic value, were several heavy stone coffins. Some still had lids. She was lying in the darkness of one of them. Gambling he wouldn't see her in the shadows would be in too much of a hurry to check. They were so close to the river here. He could hear it whispering to him. He could drag her to it, hold her head under the surface. She wasn't big enough to struggle hard, especially if he put his entire weight on her and pressed down. Then he'd let the river take her body. There were five coffins. Two had lids, and she wouldn't be strong enough to have raised and lowered a stone lid. One was too shallow. That left two. He stepped closer and felt the warm glow in his belly grow cold as he realised he was hunting for his quarry in a coffin. She'd already cheated death twice. Maybe there was something not quite natural about this girl. He crept closer still. Jessica! He called. He couldn't resist it. They always freaked when he called their names like that, soft and low. He looked around at the high white walls and pitched roof, at the ruined wall of the old building, the nearby trees, the slick black river. He didn't want to get too close to those coffins. And yet he had no choice. He took a step, and another. Police, stay where you are. A light shone in his face, then another from the opposite direction. Put your hands up. Put them where we can see them. Two police officers, both in high-vis jackets, were approaching from both sides. What's going on? He did as he was told, thanking his lucky stars he'd changed his T-shirt in the van and cleaned his hands. Who are you, and what are you doing here? One of the officers was frisking him, running his hands down his body, his legs, around his waist. I'm meeting someone. Is that a frigging crime now? This park's closed after dark. Which is why I'm here. I thought I wouldn't be disturbed. You guys got any real villains to chase? Both officers stood facing him. What's your name? Got any ID on you? Wallet. An inner jacket pocket. He raised both arms again to let them reach in and find his wallet. Mr. Patrick Farr of Kirk Yetham. The police officer read his driving licence with his torch. What's your business in York, Mr. Farr? Came to see a man about a horse. The officer looked around. I can't see a horse. That was only good for the knacker's yard. I'm not a mug. Who are you meeting here? A gentleman doesn't kiss and tell. Stalemate. The two stepped to one side and talked to each other in low voices. Then a third copper appeared from the park. A fourth walked along the river. The park was lousy with the filth. OK, I'm guilty of hoping for an illicit shag with a married woman. Arrest me, and let's get on with it, I'm fucking freezing. He stuck his hand in his jeans pocket and pulled out the condom he always kept there. Neither of you guys got a use for this, because I sure as hell don't anymore. One of the officers stepped back, 
The other shone his torch around the building, the ruins, towards the river. Have you seen anyone else since you've been here? The copper asked him. Not a soul. I heard your footsteps and I thought my luck was in. <laughs> Just goes to show. His wallet was handed back. Seeing as how your date hasn't shown up, I don't think you'll mind coming down to the station to answer a few questions. He put up his hands. You are fucking kidding me. Walk this way, if you would, sir. One constable took hold of Patrick's upper arm. For a second he was tempted to fight back. Then he realised what a mistake that would be. He was going to have to go quietly. His mother would kill him. Chapter 79 She waited a long time. Even after Patrick Farr was led away, she stayed where she was. She kept her eyes closed and her body very still while the police officers wandered around the old Tudor building, shining one end of their torches into corners, poking the other into bushes. They spent ages peering into the ooze, as though she might be beneath its surface, breathing through a reed, waiting to emerge. They didn't really look up. They didn't shine their torches into the tops of trees, into the high places. If they had done, they might have seen her. By the time she was sure they'd gone, she had to force herself to move, to push away from the stone lining of the medieval window, to get down onto her haunches on the uneven and uncomfortable window ledge, to climb the fifteen feet down to the ground. Three times now. He'd made the same mistake. He hadn't looked up. Not properly. She didn't go back the same way she'd entered the gardens. She wasn't that stupid. Instead, she took the long route, past the abbey ruins, behind the museum and over the wall into St. Leonard's Place. Back in the city, she set off towards the bridge. Far had really, really pissed her off now. She was done running. Chapter 80 Ajax gave his name to the uniformed officer controlling the crime scene and was allowed to walk down the street. It was a row of terraced houses, once considered quite modest, now desirable city centre residences. Each house was brick-built, with a porticoed front door and two tall, narrow windows. Tiny gardens at the front were edged in black railings. As he approached the house, several faces watched him from nearby properties. A tall woman, her white Tyvek suit noticeably short on her ankles, strode out through the front door. Her hair was short and dark, her face heavy and plain. She looked at his warrant card. Did you know Jessica Lane? she asked him. Had you met her? I've been looking at a photograph for two days now, and I saw the body of her sister earlier. By all accounts, they were very alike. She looked him up and down. Better get suited up. He followed D.I. Dickinson down the narrow front hallway, past photographers and crime scene investigators, through the living room and into the kitchen. A small cloakroom stood off to one side of the back door. That's a coat, said Ajax, as his eyes fell on the blue anorak hanging in the cloakroom. She borrowed it from a hiker. Yeah, we thought so. OK, Alan, bag it and the shoes. Beneath the blue coat were a pair of brogues, covered in mud, ruined. I was told someone would be watching this house in case she returned, Ajax said. We had cars doing drive-bys. We don't have the officers to keep someone outside 24-7. Not for a missing persons case, which was all this was up until now. So what happened? You better come upstairs. Ajax followed Dickinson back through the house, up the stairs and into the bedroom at the front. 
It looked and smelled like an abattoir. One of the bodies, the male, was already being moved into a body bag. The other lay face up on the carpet. This is how we found her, said Dickinson. For a few seconds, Ajax could see nothing but blood. Then he forced himself to look past the gore to the features beneath. A woman in her mid-thirties, an attractive face, if perhaps a little horsey. The nose was prominent, the chin quite long. Her cheekbones were thin, but her eyes had been large and blue. Her hair was dark brown, chin-length, curly, which had probably caused the confusion. She lay half covering a blood-stained green jacket. The court looks familiar, said Ajax, and there's definitely a superficial resemblance, but that's not Jessica. No, we didn't think so, said Dickinson. I didn't want to influence you one way or the other, but after I called you, we found a woman's handbag downstairs with a number of credit cards belonging to a Zara Jenning. If you asked me to guess, I'd say your Miss Lane got home, a bit stressed after her experience, found her fiancé having sex with another woman, and flipped. Well, said Ajax, at least I know why she ran this time. Chapter 81 Patrick couldn't stay in York any longer. Already he'd be cutting it fine. He left the police station and half-jogged, half-walked to his van. They detained him for longer than they should, but not as long as they could have done. Small mercies. Coppers were always looking for a chance to pin one on the pikey bastards. But in the end they had no reason not to believe his story about being in the park to meet a girlfriend. And as for what had happened in the southwestern corner of the city this evening, they were looking for someone slim and fast, almost certainly female, not a short, stocky bloke. He got back to the van to find he hadn't locked it. He climbed in, started the engine and headed out of the city. In less than two hours he was on the outskirts of Newcastle. Another hour and he was turning into the small harbour south of Berwick-upon-Tweed, he drove all the way down to the sea wall. The tide was up, sending black waves high into the air, filling the world with oily salt water droplets. A cold wind was coming in off the North Sea, and the sky was a swirling mass of black clouds. His Uncle Tommy was waiting for him. A few men hung around in the shadows. The boat had already docked. He put the van into reverse, backed down the slipway, and then watched in the wing mirror as a group of six people left the cabin of the boat, stepped ashore, and climbed into the back of his van. He felt the vehicle rock as each clambered inside, heard the shuffling and the grunts as they tried to find somewhere verging on comfortable for the journey ahead. He kept his eyes on the slipway as his uncle closed the doors, and vanished into the night. Not a word had been said. Patrick started the engine and pulled away, thinking the van felt heavy, even allowing for the six extra bodies it was now carrying. Actually, there were seven people in the back of the van, one of whom had slipped inside the unlocked doors while Patrick had been detained by the police in York, and who lay now curved around the front right wheel arch, out of sight beneath a dirt-encrusted horse blanket. As one of the others in the van, a woman, began to croon in a low-pitched voice, she closed her eyes. Chapter 82 Two Months Earlier the cluster of singing nuns moved out of the garden of reflection and repose at Winding Priory and made their way back towards the convent building. Their voices fading as they gained greater distance from the group they'd left behind. In the garden, placed around the central shrine to the Holy Mother, 
were two semicircular stone seats that allowed several sisters at once to sit and pray. The garden was also a favourite spot for the convent's peacocks, although they preferred to perch on the walls, still as statues, staring unblinkingly down at those who walked and sat below. Jessica had never been in the garden without an audience of the birds, and never failed to find it unnerving. On the other hand, the colours and the scents, especially on a summer evening, made it one of her favourite places in the convent. On the central stone seats, she and eight of the sisters were huddled together. Sister Serapis was stroking the head of a large peacock that she'd previously introduced as Pea Coat. So, Sister Eugenia was bang on the money with her suggestion about a computer search combining the terms black people and organ donation, Jessica said, because thanks to her, I found a little girl called Ayat Ackle. A couple of the sisters' lips moved, as though they were trying the foreign name out for themselves. Ayat died in a car accident on the outskirts of Liverpool, Jessica went on. She was with her parents, in the family convertible, top-down, on the way home from Chester Zoo. This all happened late last year, although I didn't find out about it until March. Anyway, Ayat released her seatbelt. Her parents didn't notice. When the father had to brake hard to avoid an animal on the road, a, a cat, I think, although that was never confirmed or the animal found, Ayat, well... I'm sure you can imagine. She was thrown some distance and fatally wounded. Distress was visible on every face around her, except that of Isabel. The police were called. The road was closed. Ayat and her mother were flown by air ambulance to the nearest hospital, but the little girl was pronounced dead on arrival. Jessica finished the story. And how... Was this of interest to you? Sister Tabitha asked. Her parents offered to donate her organs, said Isabel. Just offered them up, as in, anybody want these? Sorry to interrupt, but I've heard this before. Goodness, said Tabitha. That's actually quite rare, Jessica said, and they didn't seem to be showing much emotion. So the senior registrar acted on his instincts and phoned the police. Unfortunately, while he was still waiting for them, he made the mistake of asking Ayat's parents for identification. They didn't have any, guessed Sister Belinda, a small, rotund nun in her fifties. They had plenty. The father offered a driving license, the mother a passport, according to which she was a British citizen born in Jordan, the father showed the doctor photographs of his family taken on his phone. The mother produced the child's donor card. It all looked above board, but felt a bit too... Easy? suggested Tabitha. Planned? Exactly. The registrar left the parents in the family room and took their ID to his office. When the police arrived and he took them to the parents, they were gone. The driving licence and passport turned out to be fake. A different family entirely lived at the address the couple had given. A twelve-year-old girl called Ayat Arkel was on the transport database, but the police could find no evidence of her birth or life prior to the accident. Her so-called parents still haven't been found. Could it perhaps have been a family of illegal immigrants, who panicked when the doctor started checking ID. Sister Florentina, one of the keenest gardeners, had been gathering fat pink roses. She waved them around when she spoke, and Jessica, sitting close, kept catching their rich, musky scent. So they left the daughter behind. Belinda looked shocked. Their dead daughter, Isabel reminded them, Maybe sentiment doesn't last too long when you're desperate. What happened to the child? To her body, I mean. Still in the mortuary, said Jessica. 
At some point she'll have to be cremated if she isn't claimed. But we have no idea who this child really was, or, or whether the couple with her were actually her parents? Florentina asked. No, it's still an open case, Jessica replied. Sister Belinda leaned forward. But the child could have been already dead, or technically brain-dead, when her so-called parents put her in the car. Whatever killed her originally, let's say it was a head wound, would have been disguised by the more recent injury. Not so, Sister Eugenia jumped in. A pathologist can differentiate fresh wounds from less recent ones. The body starts healing itself immediately, and signs of the healing process are manifest during post-mortems. All heads turned to Eugenia. She gave an exaggerated shrug. I watched five episodes of Silent Witness on catch-up when you all had the flu last winter. I did wonder that myself, said Jessica. But first up, Sister Eugenia is right, and second, people who are brain-dead are kept alive artificially. If there'd been life-support machines in the back of that convertible, I think the motorway police would have spotted them. They didn't spot the cat, said Sister Tabitha. Up on the walls, one of the peacocks gave a sharp cry and spread its tail. All nine women looked towards it, the nuns with smiles of pride. Jessica suppressed a shudder. Isabel was sitting opposite Jessica. How long would someone live after being taken off life support? she asked. Jessica shook her head. You'd have to ask a doctor that, not a detective. My mother lasted three days, said Sister Alfreda. And she was ninety-eight. Sister Belinda had been staring down at her feet. There could have been signs that would prove the brain had been inactive for several days before the child's death. But the... What do they call those doctors who cut open dead bodies? Pathologists, said Sister Eugenia. Yes, thank you. Well, the pathologist wouldn't think to look for them. Why would he? Jessica, you say that the child is still at the hospital. He could carry out a second post-mortem, couldn't he? I'm sure he could, but I don't have the authority to request one. Sister Basilia had been silent up to now. She raised a hand. Illegal immigrants driving a convertible. Jessica turned to her. Yes, I thought that too. And guess what? The police haven't been able to trace the car. But what would be the point? said Isabel. Even if the accident was staged, if the so-called parents deliberately killed the child so that they could offer up her organs, even if there was someone seriously ill in a nearby hospital more than willing to pay a fortune, that child's organs would still go into the system. They could end up anywhere. Uh, not necessarily, said Jessica. What do you mean? Jessica looked round at eight eager, worried faces, and the curious reptilian stare of the peacocks. I think these people are playing the system, making it work for them. I think... Good evening, sisters. More than one of the nuns jumped. Three of the younger ones got to their feet. You missed a highly entertaining episode of the Big Bang Theory, when Sheldon and Howard got into an altercation about a parking spot at the university. Sheldon was reluctant to cede one of the perks of office, in spite of having no interest in driving or owning a car. Amy left her own car there to deter Howard, and Bernadette had it towed. Penny sustained an accidental injury to her nose. These women had a remarkable ability to close their faces, thought Jessica. Each of the nuns appeared to be lost in thought, 
Only Isabel held eye contact with her superior. Also, I thought you might appreciate a reminder that recreation hour finishes in five minutes, that it usually takes at least that time to get the peacocks to bed, and that a state of considerable excitement is an unwise preparation for a return to the great silence. With mutterings of, Yes, mother, of, of course, mother, the sisters all got to their feet and turned to leave the garden. One moment, Sister Maria Magdalena and Jessica. Stay behind, if you please. The three women waited until the other nuns had left the garden, until they heard the chirruping sound Sister Serapis made when she was calling the peacocks home to roost. Hildegard said, This case of yours is disturbing the sisters, Jessica. In Jessie's defence, they followed us in here. They asked her about it, said Isabel. Jessica has no need of a defence, sister. I am accusing her of nothing. Isabel's voice was clipped. My apologies. We live apart from the outside world for a reason, said Hildegard. Our minds are free. Unfettered by the constraints of what is going on around us, to bring us closer to God. Jessica, I cannot expect you to understand this, but Sister Maria Magdalena has been part of our community for over twenty years now. She knew, as few others would, of the disturbing impact that talk of such matters can have. Begging your pardon, Mother, Hildegard held up a hand. Don't bother, sister. I know exactly what you're about to say. I am at fault for encouraging you to share the news of Jessica's work with the other sisters. I hardly expected they would take to it with such relish. But now I'm bringing it to a close. Jessica, it would be better if you didn't visit here again for some time. Mother Hildegard, is that really necessary? I completely understand your concerns. I won't talk about my work any more. Not even with Bella. I mean, with Sister Maria Magdalena. My dear, my fondness for you has left me blind to the distraction you present. You will always be welcome here. But it would be a kindness on your part to leave Sister Maria Magdalena to her reflections for a while. Isabel's eyes were on the ground, her face set tight. Sister has a birthday at the end of the summer, Hildegard said. An important one. I'm sure by then she will be ready to welcome you back. Isabel's birthday was in September, nearly eight weeks away. That's little matter you discussed with me last time you were here. Hildegard stopped on the path and turned back to Jessica. That surprise you had in mind? To celebrate our sister's birthday? You said you'd think about it, Jessica said as Isabel gave her a puzzled frown. Well, I've thought about it, and I think it would be a good idea. Something to look forward to. The bell began to toll. And silence comes for us again, said Hildegard. You can see yourself out, dear, can't you? Goodbye, until September. Chapter 83 Thursday, the 21st of September The people sharing her space in the back of the van were mainly women, she thought. But occasionally she caught the lower tones of a man, or the squeak of a very young child. The soundtrack for the journey became one of heavy breathing, coughing, clearing of throats, the occasional word or two in a language she didn't recognise. She could smell them. Sweat, urine, vomit, soiled nappies, stale smells that spoke of captivity and degradation. Not so very long ago she'd soaked in a floral-scented bath. It was possible that they could smell her, too that they'd already spotted the odd-shaped lump under the blanket and were on the point of pulling it up and exposing her. 
A child cried. His mother crooned. Far banged on the cab and yelled for quiet. The child cried on and on, until it seemed that her head had always been filled with the sound of a young child crying. Chapter 84 Seventeen Months Earlier Sister Belinda spotted Jessica and Isabel in the window seat of the recreation room and marched across. She stopped directly in front of Jessica and pushed forward her ample bosom. There was a badge pinned to her right breast that read, Ask me about my new grandson. Hey, Sister Belinda, what's new with you? Jessica teased. Max Lionel Hartnell, seven pounds, three ounces, born at 10.55 in the morning of the 5th of May. I expect you have a picture or two? Jessica said. Belinda fished inside her habit. Jessica was never entirely sure how Nun's clothes were put together, and handed the photograph over. Oh, he's beautiful. Isabel, look at his little fists. Ah, and his nose. How can that nose be real? Bella, look. Jessica held the picture out to her sister. I've seen it. Isabel didn't move, didn't even look. Have you been to see him yet? Jessica asked Belinda. I'm sure his parents will bring him when he's old enough to travel. Sister Belinda's voice had flattened. Her smile faded as Isabel stood up silently and moved across the room. Bella! Jessica caught up with her sister in the vegetable garden of the Priory. What's up? Nothing. Isabel bent to snap a dried flower head off its stalk. But you have to remember that child is four days old now and the rest of us have heard of nothing else since he pushed his way out into the world. And it wasn't very tactful to ask about visiting. You know we don't leave here except in exceptional circumstances. She straightened up and set off down the narrow gravel path. Jessica followed close behind. Well, Sister Belinda has left two children and several grandchildren for the sake of her faith, she told the back of her sister's head. It can't be easy for her. Belinda's children are adults. Isabel seemed weary of the conversation. And she probably sees more of them than lots of mothers do their grown-up families. I assure you, no one need feel sorry for her. This isn't like you. Isabel paused on the gravel. I've lived here since I was eighteen, Jessica. Maybe you don't know the real me any more. I don't believe that. Her sister carried on walking. Suit yourself? Jessica let Isabel get half the path ahead, then set off after her again. Her heart was beating fast. She was going to do it before she chickened out again. She was going to ask her. When you were sixteen, you went away and I didn't see you for months. Nervousness made her voice louder than necessary. Where did you go? I know you didn't come here, not then. Isabel had reached the corner and swivelled on the spot ninety degrees to head back to the house. It was a very long time ago. I hardly remember those days. Rubbish. Were you pregnant? Isabel kept on walking. Is that why you can't bear even to talk about babies? Were you pregnant with his child? Jessica stopped, taken aback by the enormity of what had occurred to her. Jesus wept. I can't even begin. Bella, did you have an abortion? When Isabel turned again, her eyes were shining and her face clenched tight. Jessica had never seen such a look on her sister's face before. For a second she thought Isabel might hit her. Then her face relaxed and Jessica caught a glimpse of how her sister might look as an old woman. 
No, Jessica. Isabel gave a long, heavy sigh. I did not have an abortion. I'm a devout Catholic, remember? Chapter 85 Friday, the 22nd of September The van travelled on. The baby allowed itself to be soothed. Someone leaned against her. Another child, she thought. Someone light. She felt his warmth through the blanket, felt him wriggle into a comfortable position. Then his head settled down on her hip and he gave a sleepy little sigh. Now she couldn't move at all, because he would feel her beneath him. They drove for what she guessed was another twenty minutes, and she could tell from the speed of the vehicle and the smoothness of the ride that they were still on the A1. Then the van slowed and turned in a wide, sweeping bend as they left the main road behind. She'd known when she climbed into the van that Patrick Farr would almost certainly drive back north, and so it had proven. They would be heading inland now towards the National Park and the Scottish border, towards where the balloon had taken off and come down. She closed her eyes, tried to zone out the pain of being pressed against ridged metal. She tried not to think about the growing nausea and told herself it wouldn't be long now. Not long now. The vehicle slowed almost to a crawl as the road deteriorated. They bounced over potholes, and had it not been for the alarmed cries from the other passengers, someone would surely have heard her whimper in pain as her shoulder banged hard against metal. They stopped. The murmuring hushed. She heard voices outside the van in English, but too fast to catch any of the words. And then the grinding of metal over tarmac as gates opened. The van pulled forward, turned, travelled on a few more metres and stopped. People were waiting for them. She heard more voices, footsteps drawing closer, the barking of a dog. This was where it could all go terribly, terribly wrong. The van doors were pulled open. Passengers began to get up. They'd fallen silent again, sullen and scared. The baby cried. Beneath the horse blanket she held her breath. When the last passenger had jumped down, the doors were slammed shut. She pushed herself up ignoring the shooting pains that ran up her legs, and keeping hold of the blanket crawled towards the doors. When she risked lifting her eyes above the lower rim of the rear window, she saw a junkyard. Bare electric bulbs had been strung around the site, creating dirty pools of light in the darkness. There were piles of rubbish everywhere. The passengers from the van were being herded towards a large old farmhouse about fifteen metres away. Dark-haired men and women surrounded them. At least two of the men held the leads of German shepherds. The dogs barked. Several of the bystanders followed the van's passengers into the farmhouse. Others hung around, talking quietly together. The yard they were in was enclosed by a high wire fence and a towering wall of old cars. Junk was everywhere. Old fridges, washing machines, stuff overflowing from huge metal skips. In a semicircle around the house, like wagons from the Wild West, stood several caravans. There were lights in most of them. Some had garish fairy lights strung around the windows. One had been completely burned out. They didn't lock the van. They probably figured they didn't need to, seeing that the compound they were in was fenced and they had guard dogs. In twos and threes, the people of this odd community returned to their caravans. Lights went out. Quiet fell over the site. She waited as long as she dared. And some more. Then she opened the van door. Nothing happened. No one yelled. No dog barked. She closed the door and slipped round to the driver's door. 
Before the vehicle left York, she'd already checked beneath the front seats and in the glove compartments. She checked again, but found nothing. Neil's phone, if it was still in Farr's possession, was probably in the pocket of his leather jacket and she'd taken a huge risk for nothing. On the other hand, she was a whole lot closer to where she needed to be. Leaving the van, she crept across the gravel. Amidst the rubbish, she could see echoes of the community's Romany past. A painted wooden chest here, an enormous caravan wheel there. Hanging from a cast-iron lamppost was the carcass of a deer, its dead eyes gleaming in the moonlight as she walked past. She passed a massive cairn of stones that formed a shrine for the Holy Mother. A statue of Mary stood patient and sad before it, a scattering of plastic flowers at her feet. The plaster had chipped from her face below one eye, making it look as though the statue were weeping. In the shadow of the farmhouse, feeling less exposed, she let herself look around. The sight was bigger than she'd pictured from the limited visibility of the van. It stretched back, away from the road, filled with the dying shells of cars. They lay in rows, piled high, reaching back towards the woods in the distance. There were dozens, maybe hundreds of old cars on this site, and every pair of headlights looked like eyes. She set off again, this time following the line of the fence that ran along the road, keeping to the shelter of the hollowed-out cars. After a few metres, her heart sank. Directly ahead, she could see the close weave of the wire fence. It had turned a corner. She pressed on, needing to be sure. Twenty metres further, by a skip pushed close to the road, was a collection of discarded bicycles. Some were missing wheels, some had no handlebars, but a few looked to be in working order. A bike would cut her journey time in more than half. She chose one that looked about her size and dragged it with her, until she reached the corner and saw that the fence did indeed encircle the site. She was trapped. Her options were fast running out. If she stayed where she was, she'd be found by the dogs in the morning. She could climb back in the van and wait for it to be driven out of the sight, or keep walking along the line of the fence, hoping to find a gap. Maybe even tunnel underneath. The last seemed the only sensible option. She set off again, pushing the bike when she could, carrying it when she couldn't. A night bird screeched, and then an answering scream that sounded more human than animal seemed to come from the farmhouse. Ahead there was a car pushed right up against the fence one she couldn't walk around. She picked up the bike and put it on the roof of the car before climbing through. On the other side, something caught her eye. A piece of fabric, about four feet from the ground, had snagged on the fence. In the daylight it would probably be a bright emerald green, possibly the exact colour of the jacket she'd been wearing all yesterday. It was a scrunchie, the sort of thing women use to keep long hair back from their faces. When she touched the material, it felt soft and damp. She tucked it into the pocket of her coat and saw a way out. There was a way out. The fence had been clipped through, from the ground to about four feet up, at the exact point she'd found the scrunchie, and then fastened back together again with a length of wire. From a distance, especially at night, no one would spot it. She'd have missed it herself if the scrunchie with its old memories hadn't caught her attention. Ten minutes later she was through. Then she only had to push the bike through the mud of the nearby field, lift it over a gate, and she was on the road. An hour later she was at the pub car park, where she and her sister had left their car two mornings ago. The keys were still in her rucksack. Chapter 
Chapter 86 She left the car a mile from the convent and travelled the last part of the journey by bike, riding past the gated main entrance and on down the road to the farm that centuries ago had belonged to the Carmelites. She cycled up the farm track, not worrying about the dogs who might bark initially, but who knew her scent. They only looked at her with mild curiosity as she went past, their eyes closing again before she was out of sight. To the rear of the farmhouse was an old path that led directly to the priory. She parked the bike in the sheds by the convent's one and only car. It was nearly three in the morning, and all the nuns would be asleep or trying to sleep. Shortly after four they would be up for morning prayers. To the rear of the kitchens was a lean-to shed, where the nuns kept their outdoor boots and gardening aprons. By moving a waste bin right up to it, she could climb onto the window ledge and then its flat roof. From there, it was a matter of using the crenellated stonework as a ladder to take her up to a ledge that ran around the second story. The ledge was wide enough to stroll around although she didn't quite have the nerve to do that. She stepped sideways, her back to the wall, her hands feeling and counting each window frame. The ninth was the sister's bathroom, and the old window hadn't been repaired in years. It opened easily, and the familiar smell of sour, wasted femininity hit her. She lowered the rucksack to the floor, and climbed in after it. The room, or cell, in which a nun known as Sister Maria Magdalena had slept the night before the balloon crash, was on the opposite side of the corridor, two doors down. She pushed the door open carefully. It was empty, completely empty. All trace of its former occupant had been removed, even the bed was bare of its sheets and blankets. It didn't matter. All she needed was time and privacy. She sat down on the bed, put her feet up, and opened the laptop. Chapter 87 Two Months Earlier Adar Nasser's body was thin, twisted out of its true line as though someone had pulled tight her internal strings, distorting limbs, bending the spine, crooking the neck. She was staring up at the ceiling of the hospital room, and each blink of the lashless lid seemed to make her eyes less lustrous. She looked like a corpse that death had overlooked. Jessica approached slowly. Adar's care was low-tech. She could breathe unaided. She had a tube connected to her stomach that dripped nutrition in, and another plumbed into her bladder. The bed was raised to prevent fluids gathering in her lungs. Five months ago, Adar had tried to take her own life. She'd climbed to the roof of a four-storey apartment block in Derby and jumped. Landing among rubbish bags, she'd broken her neck and spine in two places and suffered a significant head injury. Her left fibula and tibia were fractured, her wrist broken, and eight ribs cracked. Internal injuries included a ruptured spleen, traumatic contusions to her heart and lungs, and traumatic tearing of her bowel. Footsteps alerted Jessica to the presence of a nurse. "'You can go and sit with her,' he said. "'She responds to visitors.' "'The report said she'd suffered brain damage,' Jessica said. We don't know how bad the damage is because the tests we can do are limited, the nurse replied. She talks, just doesn't make much sense. And no memory of the accident. She hasn't told anyone why she did it. Not that I'm aware of. Any sign of her family? He shook his head. Shortly after Adar's arrival in A&E, her father and brother had pitched up. They'd stayed with her for twenty-four hours. When they'd been told their relative was out of danger for the time being, they'd left to go home, shower and eat. They'd never returned. Did she carry a donor card? 
the nurse looked shocked. There's no question of that, I'm afraid. She may be very badly injured, but... I understand. I have a particular reason for asking. Do you know if she carried a card? Oh, I can check. He walked behind the desk at the nurse's station and peered at the computer. A moment later he looked up. Oh, she did. A beeping sounded. The nurse pulled a monitor out of his pocket. I'm wanted. Jessica walked across and took a seat by Adar's bed. Adar? She held up her warrant card. I'm a police officer. Adar flinched but didn't even look at Jessica or the card. Can you tell me your name? No response. Is it Adar? Or something else entirely? No police. Going to Yellow House. Yellow House? Jessica leaned forward. Adar, where's the Yellow House? Any look? Jessica turned to see the nurse had reappeared. She seemed agitated when I mentioned the police. Oh, yes, we had an incident when some uniformed officers came to talk to her. We think she might be here illegally. She doesn't have any documents? Nope. Their relatives disappeared and haven't been seen since. There's no one to ask. Any possessions? A phone? Oh, actually, that does ring a bell. The nurse spun on his heel. Give me a second. Jessica watched him stride back to the nurse's station and lean behind it. He tapped away on the computer keyboard for a few seconds. I thought so, he said when he returned. One of her relatives left a phone behind. It slipped down behind the bed. We hung on to it for a while, then we handed it over to the police. Has she ever mentioned the yellow house to you? He shook his head. Yellow what? The detective constable with Derbyshire Constabulary CID leaned back on his chair and scratched the side of his head. Yep, I took it from the ward. Handed it over to the technical guys to see if they could get anything off it. And did they? No idea. I got moved on to another case. Can you find out? Jessica asked. His eyes narrowed. Then he sighed. I suppose I can make a couple of phone calls. She resisted the temptation to hand him his desk phone. I'd appreciate it. While the detective was on the phone, Jessica looked out of the window, waiting for the banter to be concluded for the nods and grunts and fixed stares in her direction to be done with. Finally, he put the phone down and turned to face the other side of the room. Right. Jez. 7.20 on the 15th. Bring the gear. Yeah, right. Jessica was on the point of clearing her throat when he seemed to remember her presence. He turned back to his desk and picked the phone up again. He's gone. Gone where? Northumbria police claimed it. They signed it out a couple of weeks ago. Northumbria? The North is a bad place. Northumbria was hours away. She couldn't possibly get there today, and one day was all she'd been given. Why would Northumbria want it? He gave her a how-should-I-know look. Something to do with a case they had that sounded similar. They thought she might be from their neck of the woods. Who? Who in Northumbria? I think there must be some mistake, said the voice down the phone line. I haven't been anywhere near Derby this year. Jessica sat in her car, watching the rain on the windows blot out the outside world. I'm a Derbyshire Constabulary HQ now, she said. They told me you collected a mobile phone, left behind by a suspected illegal immigrant, that you were dealing with a similar case. Mm, when was this? Jessica gave the date. Nope, definitely not me. I was on a training course that day. I'm looking at my diary now. 
A dozen people can vouch for me. You're definitely Paul Rodriguez? Mm, last time I checked. Anyone there with a similar name? Of the same rank? Not that I know of. The sisters lay side by side on the coarse beach towels that Jessica had thrown over the damp sand. Isabel's cloak covered their naked bodies. Above them the night sky was clear. The tide was high. The waves whispered gently a few feet away. So who's lying? Isabel said. Rodriguez or Derbyshire Constabulary? Jessica pressed closer to her sister's cold skin, felt the crustiness of the sea salt scratching between them. I'm inclined to think neither. It's too easy to check up on both of them. So how can a piece of evidence disappear? Oh, you'd be surprised. But if you want my best guess, I'd say someone borrowed Rodrigo's warrant card that day. Or faked something up to look like his, counting on the evidence handler at Derbyshire Constabulary not checking too thoroughly. Hmm, so definitely someone from Northumbria. But not Rodriguez. Hmm, looks like it. There's another reason I think there's something going on up here. Nobody wants to go to the northern ports? The Eritrean family supposedly being sent to the north? Well, that too, but as I was sitting in my car outside Derbyshire HQ, trying not to break something, I was that mad, I started flicking back through my notes. Jessica glanced sideways to make sure that Isabel was still listening. She was. When someone is admitted to hospital, basic information is taken. Name, address, age, history of allergies, name and address of general practitioner. So, Adar Nasser's GP is a Dr. Brown of New Chapel Surgery, High Street, Banbury. A GP in the southeast. Even though Adar was supposed to live in Derby. Well, it's not that uncommon. People move and then don't change their GP until they get sick. So the hospital staff didn't question it. Well, that's it then. You contact the GP. They'll have patient records. You can find out who she really is. Jessica smiled. Oh, I thought of that. Even Derbyshire police thought of that. Turns out there is no such GP's practice. There was a Roger Brown who retired in 1996, but he's never practised in Banbury. According to Google, there's no doctor's surgery on the high street of Banbury. Hmm, so Adar's relatives lied. Just invented a GP? Choosing a common English name? That's what Derbyshire have concluded. Not you, though. Not me, though. Because I remembered seeing Ayat Ackles' hospital records, too. And I was pretty certain John Brown in Banbury rang a bell. Both cases claimed the same non-existent GP. Exactly. Isabel pushed herself upright, and cold air blew on Jessica's skin. But that's what you've been looking for. Proof that something is going on. And at least a strong suggestion that something isn't right at Northumbria Police. Jessica sat up too and reached for her coat. She pulled it around her shoulders. Oh, we've got more than that, she said. Adar's GP details included an email address, because communication between hospitals and GP surgeries is electronic these days. So... I had a word with our IT people, and we sent an email making it look as though it had come from a Derby hospital to Dr. Brown of Banbury. Nothing to raise suspicions, just a request for allergy information. We got a surgery is closed notice pinged back five seconds later. End of line. Not at all. Do you know what an IP address is? Should I? It's a number that's unique to every computer, basically every device that connects to the Internet. 
The computer in Hilda's office will have one. If we need to trace a particular computer, under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, we can request the Internet Service Provider to give us the actual address of the IP address. Are you following me? Isabel nodded. The computer that responded to us on Dr. Brown's behalf is somewhere in the head office of Northumbria Police. Wow! The ISP can't tell us which computer, out of the several hundred that are in there, but the force's internal IT department will be able to. So, what are you going to do? Well, to use a police cliché, there are several lines of inquiry that we can now follow. We're going to be working with the transplant database to check that every organ donor in the last three years was a real person, and not someone like Ayat and Adar, who were admitted under rather weak, fake identities. Well, that could take a while. We'll start with donors from Asia, India and the Middle East. There won't be that many of those. That will just prove there's a problem, though, won't it? It won't find who's responsible. True. We could issue a formal request to Northumbria's IT department to trace the actual machine that sent the email. The problem with that is, if it fails, we've let the cat out of the bag. How could it fail? Well, our guy could work in the IT department, in which case he'll be able to cover his tracks. Or whoever's doing it could be using more than one computer, in case of exactly this eventuality. What else? We've begun a low-key operation. Someone has started work at Northumbria Police Headquarters, just to see how the land lies. Huh. That someone being you? Jessica said nothing. Is it dangerous? No, of course not. Isabel's lips clamped tight. She turned away, gazing out across the sea to where the moon had appeared from behind a cloud. It was a few seconds before she spoke again. Do you ever think, Jess, that we swapped places? What on earth do you mean? The moon cast a silver path across the water, and its light glowed on Isabel's white face. You were always the timid one, she said without turning round. The one who struggled to keep up, who'd barely say boo to a goose. She glanced at Jessica and smiled. Now look at you. It was on the tip of Jessica's tongue to say, and look at you too, Bella. What happened to you? Actually, what I wonder is what the two of us could achieve if we worked together, she said instead. I thought we did. Isabel's brows contracted. She sounded hurt. Well, we do, of course. You're a great help, but that kind of makes it worse. I look at you and I see so much waste. Isabel looked back across the sea. Oh, that's because you're seeing the situation from an entirely worldly point of view. We believe that there is no more worthwhile way of spending a life than in growing closer to God. Isabel could have been reading from a textbook. Well, that would be fine, Bella, if you believed in God. But I know for an absolute fact that you don't, and you never did. Isabel closed her eyes and breathed in deeply. Then she threw back her cloak and began looking around for her clothes. Jessica knew she'd gone too far. She opened her mouth to apologise when Isabel turned back. Her black habit clutched against her. So, what's my surprise? she asked, in a voice so full of fun that the last few minutes might not have happened. You do understand the meaning of the word surprise, don't you? The sisters are running a sweepstake. Sister Belinda thinks you've got tickets to The Sound of Music at Newcastle's Theatre Royal. She's willing to share the entire pot with me if I can talk my way onto the stage during a crowd scene. 
They're winding you up. They know exactly what I have planned. You need to be ready at 4am on the 20th. Isabel gave a soft laugh. <laughs> Four in the morning. Where are we going? Not far. What do I wear? Seriously? Jessica looked at her watch. Come on, you need to get back. If Hilda catches you out skinny-dipping and me on the premises after being expressly forbidden, you'll be eighty before we can talk about a birthday celebration again. They stood and began pulling on clothes. Jess, said Isabel, when her black habit took away her form, making her white face seem to be floating in the moonlight. You will be careful, won't you? I'll be invisible said Jessica. Just like the old days. Chapter 88 Tuesday the 19th of September Three days earlier Cleaners were invisible, thought Jessica, as she ticked the chart on the wall of the second-floor ladies and carried her bucket back onto the corridor. People paid no more attention to the cleaners than they did to the colour of the walls, or the placement of the light switches, or the times the central heating clicked on. They were background noise. They'd be missed soon enough when the waste paper basket spilled over and the sticky circles on desks started to gather dust, but as long as the carpets got swept and the bins emptied, they went unnoticed. Fooling the other cleaners was far harder than fooling the police officers she was supposed to have under surveillance. Some of the other cleaners were Polish, and only by pretending to be a bit simple these last two weeks had she kept their suspicions at bay. Jessica's command of the Polish language was enough to fool a non-Pole, a native was another matter entirely. She kept her head and her eyes down when she was anywhere near the others. She cleaned well and thoroughly so that no one would have any cause to grumble about her, and she already knew which officers sat where on the second floor, which had families, photographs on desks, late afternoon calls to confirm school pick-up and dinner arrangements, and which were having affairs, furtive calls when they thought no one else was around. She knew which were smokers, which had drink problems, and, thanks to the bins full of chocolate wrappers and diet snacks, which had trouble controlling their weight. She'd already spotted the terminals that were the most likely to have been used to send the email from the fake GP's surgery. At one end of the floor was a suite of three incident rooms, each with six terminals. None were used on a daily basis, but everyone in the building would have access to them. All the time she was working on the second floor, she kept one eye on the incident rooms, for people going in at odd times. She had learned nothing of use. The building was too big. There were too many people in it. It was never empty. Between the hours of six and nine it quietened down, when those who worked normal hours went home, but there were always people covering the shifts. Were she to spend weeks coming in, she might begin to spot odd departures from the patterns. But for now, nothing. She would not have the luxury of weeks here. She made her way down the corridor, heading for the men's toilets at the other end of the floor. To her left were the lift, stairs, utility cupboards. To her right, a glass partition, beyond which were the main offices and incident rooms. As she passed the lift, something caught her eye. Tucked against the wall in the void between the two lifts was a glass-fronted display cabinet. Three shelves inside held cups, shields and photographs of sports teams and award ceremonies. She'd polished the glass yesterday. But there was a mark on it again. She stopped and reached up with a duster in her hand. A faint mark that would probably be invisible in some lights. It had been made by breath when someone had stood close to the glass, staring in. She'd cleaned exactly the same mark away yesterday. Possibly before, as well, she wasn't sure. 
She just had a feeling now that she cleaned this glass more than she might expect to. The mark was above her eye line. It had been made by someone well over six feet tall. She polished it away, looking inside to see what someone stood here and stared at so often. Directly opposite the mark was a framed cutting from a newspaper, a half-page taken from the Northumbrian Herald, containing a story and three photographs. The first picture was a headshot of a young, pretty woman with dark hair and eyes. The second, a group of uniformed police officers holding up certificates of commendation. Jessica peered closer. The same young woman, hair tied back this time, was one of the police officers. The third picture had been taken at a very elaborate funeral, with black horses pulling a glass hearse and a crowd of people following behind. A crowd of very distinctive-looking people. Brave Moira loses fight with liver disease. Beneath the headline was a date, then the story. Moira Farr had died in September, two years ago. Jessica spun slowly on the spot. She already knew there were no cameras focused on this stretch of the corridor. By the time she was facing the display case again, she had her phone in her hand. She took one photograph, then moved away. At the end of the corridor, she knocked on the door of the men's toilets. Hello? Cleaning team? Excuse me? No response. She pushed the door open, waited a second, and then left the cleaning in progress sign outside the door. Moira Farr. She knew that name. She'd known it instantly. She pushed open the cubicle door and wedged it in place. She remembered a late-night drive up the M1 to Neil's house, being exhausted after a busy week. She remembered cranking up the air conditioning to full whack and having the radio on at volume to stay awake. There'd been a story about a young woman dying of liver disease, her only chance being to find a donor within the next few days. She remembered talking to Neil about it when she couldn't sleep. He'd seen the same story on television. That woman's name had been Moira. It had stuck because she'd thought it an old-fashioned name for a young woman. Neil had thought she was from a travelling family, and that would fit because Far was a gypsy name. She hadn't known what had happened to Moira Far, hadn't wanted to find out. The case had spooked her. The toilet bowl was encrusted. She squirted cleaning fluid around the bowl, aiming up and under the rim, then leaned over, picked up the brush and got to work. So, the appeal had failed. No one had died that night, after all, and no liver had become available. Had she known Moira Farr was a police officer? She didn't think so. Certainly not a police officer who'd worked in this building. Behind her, the door opened. She didn't bother looking up. Whoever it was would see the equipment she'd left in the middle of the floor, see her backside bent over a bowl and finally allow the cleaning-in-progress sign outside to register. Whoever it was didn't. Instead, he unzipped his trousers. Jessica took the brush, replaced it in its holder and flushed the loo. Sorry, said a male voice. Been holding it for a while. He's okay. Jessica got down on her knees and began wiping the outside of the bowl. She heard the zipping again, the sound of a tap being run, then a loud clatter. Oh, shit and corruption. She moved without thinking, jumping up and stepping out. The officer, the chief constable of all people, had knocked over her bucket sending dirty, soap-flecked liquid spilling out across the floor. Jessica caught a glimpse of the man's face in the mirror, mainly side-on, but enough. Oh, dear God! She fixed her eyes on the floor again, wishing her hair was loose so that it could fall over her face and hide it. 
Is okay. I fix. Is no problem. He was standing right by her. She could see his highly polished shoes, with drops of water on them. Look, can't I just... Please, no. Is no problem. She held up both hands, fending him off. Well, if you're sure. Oh, I'm really sorry. I'll get out your way, shall I? Yes, yes, go. He left. She straightened up when the door slammed, leaning back against the cool wall in relief. He couldn't have seen her properly. He'd have said something. Fighting back the temptation to pick up her things and leave the building, she forced herself to do enough to make it look as though the room had been cleaned. When she creaked open the door, he was nowhere to be seen. The chief constable's office was at the end of the corridor. There was still another hour of her shift to go, but it couldn't be helped. She had to get out of here, now. She took the lift down and put her equipment back in the cleaning cupboard. She was supposed to sign out with her supervisor, but it didn't matter. She wouldn't be coming back again. She had to cross the car park and then the road to get to the bus stop. Her own car was parked two stops away. She dodged the traffic and managed to squeeze into a place beneath the shelter roof. Across the road, people were still leaving the station building. She glanced up at the electronic sign. The bus was still seven minutes away. She pressed as close as she could to the people standing next to her, unable to dismiss the uncomfortable sensation that she was being watched. Six minutes. Cars drove out of the police station car park, forging their way through the rivers of rain on the road. Five minutes. The traffic slowed as something out of sight caused a hold-up. Headlights shone steadily into the car park, illuminating several of the parked vehicles. One of them had an occupant. Nothing unusual in that. Lots of people had partners pick them up after work, although this particular vehicle, a steel-grey Land Rover Defender, old, mud-spattered, with a bull bar on the front and a sturdy luggage rack on the roof, looked out of place in a car park full of hatchbacks and family-sized saloons. Four minutes. The occupant got out. A man. Five foot eight, stocky build. Dark hair that fell in straggly curls to his shoulders. An oversized black leather jacket. White t-shirt. Feeling the rain, he leaned back into the vehicle and pulled out a black trilby. Fixing it firmly on his head, he set off across the car park. She lost sight of him when he disappeared behind a row of police vans. She took out her phone again, pretended to check messages for a few seconds, and then a second before the bus blocked her from view, she took a picture of the defender's registration number. Chapter 89 Friday the 22nd of September it was still dark outside when Ajax pulled into the senior staff car park and switched off his engine. The framed photograph of Sister Maria Magdalena and Jessica Lane lay on the passenger seat of his car. It would have to go back to the convent soon. He wasn't even sure what impulse had prompted him to take it away in the first place. The picture was over twenty years old. It would be no use at all in trying to identify Jessica now. Something about it had called to him. He just wasn't sure what. Whatever it was, though, it was still calling. He slipped it into his case. The message requesting his immediate presence arrived as he was going through security. He didn't bother going to his own office, but made his way to the end of the corridor. The chief looked worse than he felt. What time did you get back? he asked Ajax. Lost track, Ajax replied. Had an email from North Yorkshire waiting when I got in. He motioned for Ajax to help himself to coffee. A woman answering the description of Jessica Lane 
was pursued around the old city walls in York for several hundred metres before the pursuing officers lost sight of her near the river. They think she headed into the city. Ajax knew this already. He hadn't left York until the police there had given up hope of picking up Lane quickly. He carried his coffee to the table and sat down. They had people at the station until all the trains stopped running, said the chief. Same at the bus station. They've combed through security footage. She hasn't left York, nor has she been seen on any of the cameras around the city. She's vanished. An accomplice? Ajax drained his cup and stood up to get a refill. Someone picked her up? Well, I've got someone from the NCA coming up this morning. Going to fill us in on what she was doing up here. As much as they can, anyway. I rather got the impression that wouldn't be much. A wave of exhaustion washed over Ajax. She was in this ruddy building, John. She was investigating us. Oh, something else, the chief said. I had an early report over from the lab. It's looking like they have found brain tissue on the basket. And while they're not 100% certain, they think damage to one of the guide ropes is consistent with gunshot. Is Jessica Lane firearms trained? Ajax asked. The chief inclined his head. Outside, the blackness of the pre-dawn was beginning to splinter. Back behind his own desk, Ajax opened his case and saw the photograph, face up, the two girls staring at him. The frame was wood, cheap, had warped with age, and the picture, now that he was looking at it properly, skewed. He turned it over to see four metal clips holding the various parts together. If he were in a place that permitted only one family photograph, what would he do? He slid back the clips one by one and let the backing card fall away. There was something else. Ajax gave a little triumphant smile. He knew he'd brought this picture away for a reason. Another photograph. A four-inch square sheet of glossy white paper. An old photograph, gone a little yellow around the edges. The image was facing inward. Okay, Sister Maria. Let's find out your secret, shall we? He used the tip of a fingernail to ease the smaller picture away. It tumbled onto his lap, face up. Christ! The picture had been taken in a hospital. A maternity unit, to be exact. The only place he'd ever seen small, transparent plastic cots. Tucked under a blue blanket was a tiny form, his minuscule head showing the crustiness characteristic of newborns. Sister Maria was hiding a photograph of a baby boy. Chapter 90 Shinto, come out! The dog ignored him. Patrick called again. Nothing and raising his voice this morning hurt too much, given what he'd drunk last night. It was too goddamn early, the morning light still cold and blue. He walked up to the open rear doors of the van. Towards the front he could just about see a twitching canine tail. The dog's head was down. He'd found food, most likely. Hopefully not vomit, or God forbid human shit although it wouldn't be the first time for either. I'm done, Pat. Want me to leave it running? Patrick looked over to the far corner of the yard, where William had been rinsing out waste bins. Nah, I'll be a couple of minutes. He jumped into the van, immediately regretting the sudden movement. He took a deep breath, then another. He'd have to clear out the back of the van before he could wash it. There was a horse blanket over the wheel arch that had to come out for one thing, and whatever Shinto had found. Shinto was half under the blanket, had one paw pinning something to the van floor, 
was tearing whatever it was apart with his teeth. Patrick gave the dog a gentle kick with his foot and saw chocolate in a bright orange wrapper. Reese's peanut butter cups. He was suddenly conscious of his heartbeat. This was the same brand of candy he'd seen in Jessica Lane's house in York. That bunch of immigrants he'd picked up last night would not have been in any European shops for over a week. The chances of them bringing in the chocolate were slim. He leaned down and pressed his face close to the horse blanket. Not just horse. Not just fetid smells of captive humanity. Something fresh. Floral. A scent he distinctly remembered from the bathroom in York. Jesus. Fucking. Wept. He ran both hands over his face. What? Oh, trust his mother to be an earshot the second he blasphemed. Nothing. He got to his feet. Pat, give me a frigging minute. Pushing past her, knowing he'd pay for it later, he jumped down and set off towards the wire fence. He followed it around the compound, trailing his fingers over the steel mesh when he could, as though if he lost physical contact with it, even for a second, he could miss something. Only when he reached the Ford Mondeo, the one pushed right up against the fence, did he break away. He opened the door, climbed inside and saw the blue headscarf. Not a headscarf, a hijab. Nothing to do with the woman who might or might not have hidden in the back of his van last night, but almost certainly once owned by the girl who'd escaped the compound in the very early hours of Wednesday morning. The one who'd started this whole frigging fiasco. He climbed out of the other side of the car and stood looking at the fence. It ran all the way around the compound. How the hell had they got out? Then he saw the gap. How the hell had that got there? Chapter 91 Tuesday the 19th of September Three days earlier a pinging sound told Jessica that an email had arrived in her inbox, the one she'd been waiting for. Thank God for night shifts. She opened it. Sorry to keep you, Lane. Needed fifteen minutes to myself before I could run the search. Anyway, the vehicle in question isn't registered, but I did find a police interest report on it. Seems it's been spotted more than once entering a property in Kirk Yetham in Scotland. Known address of a notorious family of gypsies. Name of Far. Best Bazza. Jessica felt something. Energy, adrenaline, draining from her body. For a few seconds she mistook the feeling for exhaustion, then recognised it as relief. She'd known there was something familiar about that trilby. The newspaper photograph of Moira Farr's funeral had shown family members following behind the hearse. Two men and an older woman had been at the front of the grim parade. One of the men had been wearing a black trilby. Far. She accessed the police national computer and searched for the Far family of Kurt Yetham. The Far family have been living at Kirk Yetham for a long time, according to them since the 15th century. Whilst there is no way of verifying such a claim, there are no records of the property being owned by anyone other than the family. The property consists of two acres of land, much of it fenced and kept secure, and a large farmhouse-style building. According to social services and police reports, the family do not live in the house but prefer to inhabit a number of caravans, typically between eight and a dozen that encircle the house. Their income, ostensibly, comes from the scrap metal business that is run from the land. The family have strong ties and a huge sense of loyalty. Their willingness to give each other alibis has been a major stumbling block in more than one case brought against them. Cautions and convictions. 
1997, official caution given to Patrick Farr in respect of alleged theft of two bicycles. 2004, official caution to Charles Farr for driving with broken right tail light. 2005, official caution to Rebecca Farr, aged 15, for attempted shoplifting. 2010, arrest of Patrick Farr, William Farr and Jeremy Farr for drunken and disorderly conduct in a public place, bound over by magistrates to keep the peace. The black, or possibly white, sheep of the family is Moira Farr, the youngest child and only daughter of Mary Farr. Moira went to Hendon Police College and later joined Northumbria Police. Whilst her unconventional family must surely have been cause for embarrassment or unease over the years, there has never been any suggestion of Constable Farr acting improperly. On the contrary, she has received three commendations in her time at Northumbria Police. Closing down the PNC, she went back to Google searches she'd done earlier, just to read through them one last time to make sure. She was tired at last. She could sleep for a couple of hours. Tomorrow, after dropping off Isabel, she'd double-check everything she'd learned and tidy up the paperwork. On Thursday, she would go to London and update the rest of the team. Then she'd have the weekend with Neil. Finally, they might be able to start looking for wedding venues, make some firm plans. She closed down her laptop and went back into the bedroom. She climbed into bed, closed her eyes and forced a smile onto her face. It didn't work. After a couple of minutes, the muscles in her face were aching. Then she sat upright. In front of her closed eyes, a vision had appeared. One of the photographs she'd found on the internet had been of the Farr family home and the business they owned in Kirk Yetham. Right in the middle of the scrapyard was a large farmhouse, painted yellow. Chapter 92 Friday the 22nd of September Ajax, this is Detective Inspector Frank Boscombe of the National Crime Agency. Ajax let the door close on the chief's office. Only a couple of years old, the NCA was the government body responsible for investigating serious organised crime. Cybercrime, economic crime that crossed international borders, weapon and drug smuggling and human trafficking. D.I. Boscombe. Ajax nodded politely. Superintendent. Boscombe was nervous. His hand, when he picked up his coffee cup, was trembling. When he put it down, he started picking at a rough cuticle. The door opened and the chief's PA stuck her head in. Sir, call for you. Says it's urgent and personal. Wouldn't leave a name. Fifteen minutes, he told her. Sooner if I can. When the door closed again, the chief said, D.I. Boscombe is about to explain to us why an officer from the NCA was coming into our building posing as a Polish cleaner. Can I ask what you know about Project Kraken? Boscombe said. Ajax pulled a face, shook his head, noticed the boss looking equally mystified. Why don't you help us out? Well, basically, it's a joint initiative with the UK Border Force and certain regional police authorities to increase vigilance along the UK's coastline. Actually, that is ringing a bell, the chief said. We had some literature through a few months back. Posters, leaflets, that sort of thing. We sent it to the stations that have coastal responsibility. Project Kraken encourages local people to be more vigilant around the water, said Boscombe. We've got nearly 20,000 miles of coastline in the UK. We can't watch it all ourselves. Kraken is aimed at people who work in the maritime industries, or anywhere near a harbour. Fishermen, sailors, divers, even walkers. Anyone who comes into contact with the water on a regular basis 
is encouraged to keep their eyes open and report anything unusual to us. Jessica is part of a team that follows up reports we think have merit. Yeah, well, tell me if I'm missing something. But I can't see the sea from where we are, said Ajax. He caught the boss raising an eyebrow and gave him a half shrug. One of them had to play bad cop. Jessica has a particular interest in people trafficking, said Boscombe. She has language skills and, back when she was with the Met, she was often called upon to help out with the vulnerable if they couldn't get an interpreter out of bed. She came across a few boatloads, saw how people were suffering, wanted to do something about it. People trafficking has never been an issue on my patch, said the chief. Not while I've been here, anyway. That you know of, replied Boscombe. We've been getting intelligence that the increased security around Kent and London, the South in general, is forcing these gangs to move further afield. We've got signs of possible trafficking activity around East Anglia, Lincolnshire, even parts of Yorkshire. Possible activity? asked Ajax. Any actual arrests? I don't need to tell you, these people are sharp. We've been working with the regional police forces to increase surveillance, but we're talking about a lot of water and a lot of coastline, even before you take the rivers, canals and seawater lakes into account. And let's be honest now, the British are very good at smuggling. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. Bringing people into Northumberland would require a very long sea voyage, said Ajax. Where are they coming from? We're not sure. The Netherlands? Possibly even Denmark? And you're right. Bringing them in up here would require a lot of time spent at sea, and would only be worthwhile if the chances of getting in undetected were substantially higher than in the south, and if the local constabulary were deliberately looking the other way asked Ajax. I assume that's the reason she was working in this building. She thought someone in here was aiding and abetting people smugglers? Well, that's a bit of a leap, Ajax, said the boss. So tell me I'm wrong, Ajax said. I'm not at liberty to disclose the nature of Jessica's investigation, said Boscombe. The chief's cup clattered in its saucer. What I can tell you is that it had come to an end, Boscombe went on. She left this building for the last time three days ago. Tuesday. A decision she made herself for good reasons, although I can't tell you what they were. The chief got up, walked away from the table and stood with his back to them, looking out of the window. And had she found what she was looking for? Yes, I believe she had. She was reluctant to say too much via email, and also wanted a day or so to think it over. She had a day's leave and had family plans. The balloon trip, I guess. She was going to drive down to London on Thursday to brief the team. Except the balloon went down on Wednesday, and she went on the run, said Ajax. That, I admit does puzzle us. I can think of no reason why Jessica didn't contact us as soon as she could. The sister had been killed, said the chief. She might not have been thinking straight. I understand that, but Jessica is not the sort to lose it, even in the event of a tragedy. Something made her run. Something has prevented her from getting in touch. Given that same something has also led to her murdering two people, one of them her own fiancé, I think it's time you were more frank with us, said Ajax. She simply wanted in connection with those crimes at present, said the chief. There's no warrant out for her arrest. Jessica didn't kill anyone, said Boscombe. It's inconceivable. Was she licensed to carry firearms? The lab team have found traces of gunpowder in the balloon. Boscombe frowned. 
She was firearms trained, but she certainly wouldn't be carrying a weapon in the normal course of her duties. How about a knife? Here, Jax, warned the chief. Okay. Help us out now, said Ajax. Let's assume she's not in league with the bad guys. Let's assume she's running from them. She's out there on her own somewhere. She's scared, exhausted, running out of money. Where would she go? Boscombe gave Ajax a hard stare. I'd expect her to come to me. To make contact with me. Yeah, well, she's had forty-eight hours to do that. So I reckon you can stop holding your breath. Feeling that? Asked the chief. She go to York, said Boscombe. We know she did that, but it's no longer a safe space for her. Not bloody safe for anyone else while she's around. Here, Jax, get it together or leave us to it, snapped the chief. Where else? One possibility is that Jessica went to York for her laptop, said Boscombe. All the details of the case were on it. I doubt she'd risk taking it up in the balloon, and we know it's not in her car. North Yorkshire have confirmed that no laptop was found in the house. So she has it with her, said the chief. That's what I'm assuming, said Boscombe. Given the investigation she was involved in, she may not have felt comfortable contacting the local police. She may have actively wanted to avoid doing so. I wouldn't be surprised if she's making her way south. She'll know about phones being traced. She'll know about cameras at bus and train stations. If I were Jessica and I wanted to get to the office without being picked up, I'd be hitchhiking my way south. He looked at his watch. So I really should be getting back. The chief stood up. I have a call to make myself, he said. I appreciate your time, Frank. Ajax's phone began buzzing. He picked it up, meaning to hold the call, and saw who wanted to speak to him. The mortuary, he said. The chief nodded at him to take it. Ajax, said the voice on the line. I think you should get down here right away. There's something you need to see. Chapter 93 What do you mean she's here? Patrick stepped further from the farmhouse. Mobile signal wasn't great in the compound, but there was a ridge of higher ground a little way beyond the shrine to Our Lady, where it was slightly better. She was in the van last night, he admitted. Must have sneaked in while I was in police custody. I brought her all the way back here. How the fuck? The voice broke off. Patrick could hear footsteps striding along a hard floor, then... You've got to get those people out of there. Get them into the caravans. Drive north. Get off the roads as soon as you can. Already on it. He glanced back to where the entire family were moving about the site. The gates were open, and as he watched, a caravan pulled out and disappeared along the road. His mother, alone, wasn't moving, just glaring over at him. He turned his back on her, focused on the voice on the phone. There'll be time to clean the house and the site completely, said that voice. I can tell you how to do that. For now, make sure there's nothing to arouse suspicion if anyone comes looking. And clean the van. She'll have gone for her car, Patrick said. The one in the pub car park. William's out there now. We've got people watching that car. Hang on a sec. His mother was still looking. When he made eye contact, she took a step towards him. He shook his head. You're still there? Go on, he said into the phone, holding up a hand to stop his mother. The watch was taken off the car when we got the news she'd been killed in York. Putting it back on has been overlooked. I'm going to remind people now, but Will should get there ahead of them. 
Phone me as soon as you can. You can trace the car, can't you? With that, what do you call it? Number plate. Automatic number plate recognition system, yes. But once I set that in motion, we'll know officially she's back in the north, and we'll pick her up instead of... The thought was left hanging. Instead of me, Patrick said. No reply. Not to his surprise, the line went dead. Patrick turned to see his young cousin, a sneaky little bastard at the best of times, had crept up on him. You've got a problem, Pat. Jimmy had a mobile phone in his hand, the same one that Patrick had lifted from the house in York last night. What? This phone got three pictures of you sent through to it on Wednesday. Jimmy pushed the phone almost into Patrick's face to make a point. You at the old house with that girl on the ground? Two more of you chasing the balloon? It's obviously you. Your hat. Shinto. Everything. Patrick stared at his cousin and wondered if he'd get away with swiping him one. The good news is, no one's seen them, Jimmy went on. The messages weren't opened. Patrick's heartbeat, which had been racing away, calmed a little. So we're good. One of the pictures here is captioned, Jimmy said. It says, this man is involved in my current investigation. Patrick said nothing. They were sent from a phone we haven't found yet, Jimmy said. The one belonging to that police officer, Jessica Lane. So? So she has pictures of you on her phone. And another thing. She sent a message to this phone, giving the password for a laptop. Said it was important. Did you see a laptop when you were in the house? Patrick spat on the ground. I wasn't looking for information technology. No, but she would have been. If she went back to that house, it will have been to find that laptop. So she's a police officer investigating us, with pictures of you on her phone, and who knows what on her laptop. I'll tell you what, mate. If you don't find her, it's all over for you. Chapter 94 Curiouser and curiouser, said Mojo, as they pushed open the doors to the mortuary building. The pathologist came to meet them as they walked down the corridor and led them to the giant fridge where the bodies were kept. I finished the post-mortems on the balloon crash victims, he said as the door closed behind them. Nothing I wouldn't expect. All injuries consistent with blunt force trauma caused by falling from a great height. I'll be sending my report over later today. Thank you. Ajax waited. At a nod from the pathologist, an assistant pulled out one of the large steel drawers. She unzipped the bag and they saw the Carmelite nun, Sister Maria Magdalena. Her face beautiful and calm in death on one side, the other burned beyond recognition. This woman spent twenty years in a convent, the pathologist said. Closed order. Very strict. So I understand, Ajax confirmed. So you wouldn't expect her to be pregnant? Pregnant? Ajax repeated stupidly. Twelve to fourteen weeks, at a guess. Are you sure? I can show you the fetus if you want. No, said Mojo. I'll take your word for it, said Ajax. What the hell are we talking about? Visiting cure at stepping out of line? Nope. The pathologist reached to a counter and lifted a clear bag. I was a bit puzzled by these, to be honest. But I didn't want to see anything until I'd had the chance to have a good look at her. What is it? Ajax was looking at fabric black lace, 
scrunched into a heap. It's underwear, said Mojo. Black lacy briefs and a size 32D underwired bra, said the pathologist. Didn't strike me as standard convent issue. Ajax walked closer to the corpse. He looked at the face, naked of makeup, the dark curly hair. Did nuns still shave their heads? No, not for a century or more. This is a nun with some serious issues, he said. This isn't a nun at all, said the pathologist. Sister Maria Magdalena had never had her fingerprints taken, so I couldn't check them. Jessica Lane, though, as a serving police officer, had hers on file. He looked down at the dead woman and lifted her hand where her fingers still showed traces of black powder. This is Jessica. Sister Maria is the one you're looking for. Part Three Chapter Ninety Five The chiming of the hour bell was always the loudest sound heard in the convent of Winding Priory. Sister Maria Magdalena, who forty years and two days earlier had been born Isabel Jones, opened her eyes and saw the familiar cracked and yellowing ceiling. She'd often in the past thought the stains on the plaster were caused by the souls of the incarcerated women, slowly leeching out through boredom and despair. Nuns, she decided years ago, were like cruelly broken ponies, stripped of all self, emptied of humanity in a never-ending quest to become vassals of a non-existent god. She was cold, but that was nothing new of late, and a mattress, even one old and worn out like this one, was the most comfortable place she'd slept for several nights. She sat up and became conscious that she was no longer alone in the room. In the solitary wooden chair in the corner sat the stiff, solid figure of Mother Hildegard. "'Good afternoon, sister,' she said. Welcome home. Chapter 96 Isabel, said the chief. Isabel is alive. Are we sure? Sister Maria Magdalena, said Ajax. And yes, there's no doubt. The body in the mortuary is definitely Jessica. How? How the hell could we get that wrong? The body we recovered was dressed in a habit, although I can't tell you right now how that happened, and the two sisters were very alike. The chief pulled out a chair and sat down. This throws a completely new light on everything. Jessica is the one who's dead. Ajax suppressed a sigh. Most significantly, sir, I think we can forget about her hitchhiking towards London. Jessica might have done that, but someone who spent the last twenty years as a nun wouldn't have the nerve, and no reason to, either. She spent the last forty-eight hours getting the better of two police forces, said Chapman. I don't think we should underestimate this woman, whoever she is. More to the point, said Stacy. She's still the prime suspect in two murders, and we have even less idea why she was on the run in the first place. So where do we think she is? asked the chief. Still in York? Chapman said. She could be. We've been watching the train and bus station since she was spotted on Station Road. She hasn't left the city. Unless she hitched, said the chief. Sir, I can't see a woman like that hitching a lift at night from a stranger said Stacy, and if she had, there's every chance whoever picked her up will have realised and called us by now. The chief was nodding. She's going to go where she feels safe. What is it those religious types call it? Sanctuary? I bet she's in a church in York. Get on to North Yorkshire, will you, Ajax? Start with the minster. Someone will be sheltering her. I think you're right, sir, said Ajax. I think she'll be with her own kind. 
Chapter 97 She's a nun. What do you mean she's a nun? She was in the tree, Patrick said, more to himself than anyone else. Waiting for me to leave. She must have swapped clothes after I'd gone. I can't believe you've been given the runaround by a nun, said Jimmy. <laughs> the female cop was bad enough, but a fucking nun. Don't you dare touch your cousin. Mary pushed her way in between the two of them. He's only telling God's truth. She pushed a finger into his face. So let me get this straight. You saw a woman in a green jacket lying dead on the ground, and then all yesterday the entire fucking country was looking for a woman in a green jacket, and you didn't think to say, hang on, there's been a frigging mix-up. Patrick took a step back. He'd never seen his mother quite like this before. I didn't see that picture till I was in York. He stabbed his own finger at his cousin. The one that daft arse sent me was different. No green jacket. How was I to know? Is it better or worse that she's not the filth? said Jimmy. They were all distracted by the sound of the gates opening. William trotted in on one of the piebald ponies. She could still have the laptop, said Jimmy. She could know everything her sister knew. William swung himself down and led the horse to a trough. Leaving it there, he came over, shaking his head, first at Mary, then at Patrick. Are we sure? she said. Pale green fiat, William said. Not there. Rode past twice. I mean, are we sure she's a nun? She's been running around the country like a blue-assed fly. Cops there, said Patrick. Not that I saw, said William. If she's in a vehicle, she could be anywhere, said Mary. Do nuns drive cars now? If she's in a vehicle the coppers know about, she won't get far, said Patrick. They'll pick her up in a couple of hours. Then we have to let them do that, Mary said. You can't be killing a nun, Pat. She'll be at that convent place, Patrick said. What's its name? Winding Priory. He threw the end of his cigarette into the fire. Pat, where are you going? You're not going to that holy place. Pat! Chapter 98 It's all on here. The two women paused by the refectory door and Isabel held up the thin, light laptop she'd carried downstairs. The whole investigation. I finished reading it just before I fell asleep, and there was a letter to me that she wrote a couple of hours before she picked me up. She wrote lots of letters to me over the years that she never bothered to send. I found a whole file of them. I think it must have been her way of working things out for herself. Hildegard gave a tired smile. I imagine there'll be a great source of solace in time. She didn't sleep that last night, before she picked me up for the balloon trip. I thought she looked tired. She hadn't slept a wink. What on earth was she doing? Quite a lot, as it turns out. Chapter 99 Wednesday the 20th of September Two days earlier. Shortly after two in the morning, Jessica drove past the entrance to Castle Far. A very high wire fence, at least ten feet tall, and topped with a coronet of barbed wire, encircled the compound. Huge double gates were chained and padlocked. The fence stretched a good thirty metres along the roadside, before curving back into the woodland. Beyond the fence, a string of bare electric bulbs allowed her to see an area of gravel yard, a semicircle of caravans, assorted cars, trucks and vans, and beyond a pile of vehicle carcasses that seemed to go on forever. Right in the middle of the yard, facing the road, 
stood the yellow house. Two stories, five narrow windows, and a front door. There were no lights visible. It was hard to tell from a drive past, but the windows appeared to be boarded. She drove on, past the property, several hundred metres down the road, until she came to a field entrance where she could pull over. She wasn't authorised to search the property. Anything she found on an unofficial search wouldn't be admissible. What she was considering was probably very dangerous. If she was right about people being held here, she might even be putting lives at risk. On the other hand, if people were being held here, she had to act now. She slipped a pair of pliers and some heavy-duty wire into her pocket, climbed out of the car, locked it, and clambered over the gate into the field. She crossed the field, squeezed through a hedge. Another field and she was up against the high steel mesh of the perimeter fence. The house was fifty metres away. Two windows at the side, one on the upper storey, one on the lower. There were probably eight rooms in the house, maybe a couple of smaller bathrooms and utility areas. Perhaps one central staircase. The yellow render was in poor repair. It had chipped away beneath the eaves, was damp-stained close to the ground. This was not a treasured family home. The wind blew softly in her face, bringing her the smell of campfires, burning oil, septic tanks. She moved on, away from the road, following the line of the fence. As she left the shelter of the house, the caravans came into view. She counted nine. Smoke was trickling from more than one. Lights shone in at least two. She saw the shrine, the huge stone-rimmed fire with its orange glowing embers, the stockpile of gas bottles. She went on, leaving the light from the site behind as the mountains of wrecked cars loomed above her. The wind whistled through them, making eerie, almost human sounds. Occasionally the creak and groan of shifting metal made her jump. She walked on. The fence couldn't encircle the entire perimeter. That would be complete overkill. Unless the fence wasn't about keeping thieves out. She was nearing the corner. Already she could see the fence did indeed turn the corner and rim the back boundary of the site. There was no way in. She couldn't climb it. Tunnelling under didn't seem like an option. She set off back towards the house. Why didn't the family live in it? When she got to the halfway point, she reached into the inner pocket of her coat and pulled out the pliers she'd brought from the car. She tried them on a strand of wire, by way of an experiment. It sprang apart with one sharp squeeze. If she cut through twenty strands, she could peel back part of the fence and get through. It was the work of a few minutes. She crouched down and made her way through, feeling edges of wire pull at her hair. She felt resistance, and a second later heard the fabric of her jacket tear. But she was on the other side of the fence. The wire had pulled the green scrunchie from her hair, the one that was a perfect match to her favourite green jacket, and it was dangling in the fence, about four feet from the ground. Knowing it would act as a marker if she had to find her way out in a hurry, she left it in place. The cars would shield her from view. She could get almost to the caravans without anyone having a chance of seeing her. First, though, she'd have to climb through a car that had been pushed right up to the fence. She squeezed in through the missing window, noted that the car was a Ford Mondeo, and then out through the empty doorway on the other side. She moved quickly, back the way she'd come, stopping every few seconds to look around, to listen. She could see the roof of the yellow house, now the upper windows. She was getting close. The roofs of the caravans were coming into view. From somewhere very close she heard a dog barking. She crouched low. She should have anticipated this. 
Scrapyards always had dogs. She risked lifting her head, checking the wind. It was coming towards her. She was still getting whiffs of oil and sewage. A door opened. A man's voice, speaking low, but audible enough from where she was. What is it? Go see. She heard the scampering of a sizable dog. It wouldn't come straight for her, not with the wind on her side, but would find her eventually. Shinto. The door at the back of the house was open. She could see light shining out. Pat? Another voice. What the fuck's going on? Nothing. Go back to bed. She could see the huge silhouette of the dog now. It was following the line of the fence, able to detect her scent from earlier. It was a German shepherd. And that was good. German shepherds weren't the fierce attack dogs of popular belief. Neil had taught her that. It took months of hard work and patience to turn a good-natured, people-loving animal into a creature that would hunt and attack on command. Most people outside the police dog unit simply didn't bother. German shepherds were used as guard dogs because their sheer size was intimidating. Most were perfectly friendly if approached in the right way. Here, yeah, boy. She whispered the call. The dog would hear it. Shinto. Here, yeah, boy. She saw the dog's head turn her way. Saw its nose lift. It had her. It moved towards her at a steady trot rather than a full-out run, which was good because it implied less than 100% confidence. It wasn't sure about what it was going to find. What a good boy. Such a good boy. She was channeling Neil, trying to copy the way she'd seen him working with the youngest, least predictable dogs. They always gave him the difficult ones. He was one of the best trainers the unit had ever had. The trick, he always said, was never to be afraid. The dog was close now. She stayed low, reaching into her pockets for the dog treats she and Neil were never without. It was close enough for her to see the light in its eyes. Good boy. She held out her hand, clutched around a treat, and saw the dog's nose twitch. She tossed it towards him. He snatched it up in seconds. Good boy. She threw another. She had one more. Then she'd have to rely on sweet words and confidence. Oh, this really wasn't the best time to take a gamble with an unpredictable canine. The dog was upon her now, nosing towards her, then lower, seeking out the last treat. She made him hunt for it. Hey, beautiful. She reached up and scratched his head behind the ears. The exact place that all long-haired dogs love to be scratched. He carried on sniffing into the pockets of her jacket. You'll know me next time, won't you, boy? Shinto, here. The dog turned and ran back to its owner. But she'd made a friend. She was safe. From the dog, at least. Pat, what the hell's going on? Why's the fucking door open? Chill out. Dog was restless, is all. She heard the slamming of the back door and waited for things to settle down again. Then suddenly it was flung open. Get the frigging lights on! Everyone! Get up now! Instantly, light started to appear around the site. Jessica turned and scurried back towards the entrance she'd cut in the wire. At the Ford Mondeo, she paused for a second, hidden within the car's dark interior, to look back. Torches were being shone around the site. People were calling to each other. Shinto was barking excitedly. They couldn't be looking for her. But they were clearly looking for something, and sooner or later their search would widen. She squeezed out through the window. Her green scrunchie made it easy to find her escape route. She forced her way through the gap in the fence and found the length of wire from her pocket. Starting at the top, she wound it through the gap, plaiting it together, 
so that when she got to the bottom and fastened it off, anyone would have to look very closely to see the fence had been cut at all. She reached up for her scrunchie and froze. The Ford Mondeo she'd just climbed through was moving. She stared, willing it to have been a trick of the light, the moon slipping out from behind a cloud, giving the illusion of movement. Nothing. The car was still. I'll take the north fence. She was on the north side of the compound, and that voice was close. She had to go, now. She turned, ready to crouch and run. From feet away came the sound of someone landing lightly on soft ground. She turned back. Nothing. Lights couldn't reach this corner of the yard. The moon had gone again. Nothing to see. Nothing to hear. And yet the sense of a presence was very strong. She could almost believe that that glimmer, two metres the other side of the fence, wasn't metal on the old car, but the gleam of a pair of eyes. Freaked now, Jessica turned and ran. When she got back to the car, she sat for several minutes. She'd seen nothing at all to justify bringing a team out here ahead of giving her full report on Thursday. And she'd carried out an illegal search. For now, there was nothing to be done. She turned on the engine. It was barely more than an hour before she had to pick up Isabel. Chapter 100 Without warning, Jessica braked hard and pulled over to the side of the road. She made sure the road was clear, jumped out of the car, ran to the ditch and bent over it, just as her stomach clenched painfully and threw up its contents. The peanut butter cup she'd eaten in the early hours came first, then a whole load of liquid. She'd got to the point of dry heaving when she heard the car door slam. We should go back. Isabel stayed behind her. Whatever you've got planned, we can't do it if you're ill. I'm not ill. Another heave bent her double. There really was nothing left to come out. There's some water in my rucksack, would you mind? She wiped her mouth and spat while she waited for Isabel to hunt in the rucksack and then hand her the bottle. She rinsed and spat again, then drank. If this is what you're eating for breakfast these days, I'm not surprised you're throwing up. Isabel was holding up an orange wrapper. What even are Reese's peanut butter cups, anyway? Her stern face softened. I can drive us back, she said. I'm safe enough this time of day. The convent rule stipulated that at least three of the sisters had to maintain current driving licences to operate the convent-owned vehicle, an elderly silver Ford Focus. Isabel had passed her test ten years earlier. One time she and Jessica had worked out how many miles in total she'd driven. Three hundred and eighty-six was the closest they could get. We're not going back. You're not driving and I'm not ill. One last spit and she was done. Jessica turned to face her anxious sister. I'm pregnant, she added. The peanut butter cups are a craving. I'm going through them by the van load. Isabel didn't speak, but her mouth pursed into a small circle. Her eyes widened. Fourteen weeks. Due late March. We're not planning to find out the sex, but I'm not sure I'll be able to resist. Isabel stepped back until she was leaning against the car. Her face, always pale, had whitened. Are you okay? Jessica asked, not without a hint of irony. No answer. Just her sister's brown eyes looking back at her. Bella? Jessica said, when the staring contest was verging on creepy. Seriously, what is it? A lorry sped past, honking at the sight of the two women, one of them a nun at the side of the road. 
Isabel seemed to pull herself together. She gave a broad smile. It's wonderful news, she said. Congratulations. Oh, we're going to be late. Jessica stepped out into the road and climbed back into the car. She started the engine as Isabel got in. Neil must be thrilled, Isabel said. Jessica looked in her mirror and pulled out. That pause was longer than I'd have liked, said Isabel. Jessica thought about making some conventional excuse. He's got a lot on his mind at the moment. I'm not sure he's really taken it in yet. You know men, rather struck dumb by the enormity of parenthood. On the other hand, this was Isabel. As was the silence in between my giving him the news and him saying that's wonderful, said Jessica. Isabel thought for a second. You've been waiting a long time for this. Maybe it takes a while to sink in. He'll probably turn up tomorrow with a teddy. They drove on for another mile. He left his phone behind, Jessica said. In his top drawer, he said. He called me last night from a landline to say I shouldn't expect to hear from him until he gets back. Which, of course, means I can't reach him. And is that a problem? He's only away two days. No, of course it's not a problem, Jessica said. Take no notice of me. They drove for a minute or two in silence. Ahead of them the sky was lightening becoming the soft grey of dove's wings. The sun will be up soon, said Isabel. Are we doing something pagan? Jessica smiled. Be patient. The road turned west, and against the still dark horizon, the women saw a burst of flame. Did you see that? Isabel was bolt upright in her seat. Jessica smiled again. I saw it. Isabel leaned forward, practically pressing her nose against the windscreen. Her seat belt pulled her back and she unfastened it. Again! What is it? What's on fire? That, my dear, would be your ride. They'd reached the pub where they were meeting the balloon company and the other passengers. As Isabel read the sign on the company Land Rover, she gave an audible sigh, and then bounced in her seat like an excited toddler. Oh! was all she could manage. Happy birthday, Bella, said Jessica. Chapter 101 Friday the 22nd of September Patrick heaved himself over the convent wall. The ground on the other side was soft after heavy rain, and a few spindly conifer trees screened him from the house. He'd have to sprint across three hundred metres of parkland to get to it. He'd been watching the convent for a while now. Around half a dozen nuns, white aprons over their black clothes, had been working in a vegetable garden at the rear. Another was sweeping out a chicken coop. Yet another was cleaning external windows. It was creepy, the way they worked in absolute silence, almost as though none of them were aware of the others. And yet when one cut her finger on a thorn, the rest seemed to know instantly, even though the hurt nun had said nothing. They had an animal-like instinct of what was going on in the pack. That was it exactly, he realised. They were a pack. They moved and acted as one. He'd have to watch that. A bell began to toll, and the sisters reacted. They began gathering their equipment. Still no words were exchanged. They picked up buckets, hose, forks and watering cans. The one in the chicken coop pulled off yellow rubber gloves and tucked them away in a lidded bucket. They began moving back towards the house and disappeared inside. When he got closer... The door through which the nuns had disappeared blew open in front of him, and he almost lost his nerve. 
Its swinging gait was like a grin on the face of a scary clown. He had a vision of a dark-clad figure hiding behind it, luring him in. Of the whole collection of them, lying in wait. He approached carefully, standing to one side of the open door, listening, testing the air the way his dog did. They were just women, mainly old, almost certainly weak. They were nothing to be afraid of. A sudden memory flashed into his head. His dog, Shinto, not much more than a puppy being surrounded by a flock of angry, jabbering magpies. They'd flown around the young dog, swooping down, cawing and cackling like witches, always staying out of reach. Not one of the birds alone would have been a match for the dog.